Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Kirker Goldstein, and I am the editor in chief of the Emory Law Journal. It is my pleasure to join Dean Babinski and the editorial board of the Emory Law Journal in welcoming you all to the 2022 annual Randolph William Thrower Symposium. We are so delighted to have so many students, professors, and practitioners here virtually today to honor the life and legacy of Randolph Thrower and to join us in a discussion that is sure to be timely, informative, and engaging. The Emory Law Journal has hosted the Thrower Symposium since 1995. This event bears the name of a highly distinguished Emory Law alumnus, Randolph William Thrower. Mr. Thrower was a partner at Sutherland, Asbill, and Brennan, and commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service from 1969 to 1971. After graduating from law school in 1936, Mr. Thrower served in the Marine Corps during World War II and returned to private practice after the war. Among his many accomplishments, Mr. Thrower served on the ABA's Commission on Women in the Profession, was president of the Atlanta Legal Aid Society, and was chair of the Georgia State Bar Committee on the involvement of women and minorities in the profession. Mr. Thrower was also one of the founders and the first president of the Court of Federal Claims Bar Association. And he was a founding trustee of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Today's symposium is entitled The First Amendment, Gateway to Social Change. It will explore the rights guaranteed to citizens under the First Amendment. Sammy Harrell, the executive symposium editor for volume 71 of the Emory Law Journal, who has invested an incredible amount of time into planning today's event, We'll speak with you shortly about the theme, its conception, and why it matters so much today. We sincerely hope that each of you finds this symposium to be informative and thought-provoking, and we encourage you to engage with our speakers as today is only the beginning of the conversation. The ideas and debates discussed here will be memorialized in an issue of the Emory Law Journal next spring, and the issue will benefit from your contributions. Now, before I introduce Sammy Harrell, I would like to take a moment to thank all the people who made today possible. First and foremost, thank you to the Thrower Committee for your remarkable generosity. This symposium is only possible because of you, and it is a testament to your support that we have been able to hold the symposium for the last several decades. This event benefits not only the Emory Law Journal, but is also a marquee event for the entire law school and greater Atlanta community. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you also to the Thrower Committee for helping shape the vision of this year's symposium and for supporting the journal throughout the planning process. In addition, thank you to the Emory Law Faculty and Administration for providing invaluable guidance and counsel as we plan this event. We particularly thank our faculty advisors, Professor Brown and Professor Smith, and the Emory Law faculty participating in today's symposium, including Dean Babinski and Professors Broyd, Jack, Hutchinson, Lawrence, and Weber, who are serving as speakers and moderators for us today. We also could not have executed this event without Rhonda Heerman, Tierra Copeland, Kenyatta Greer, and Susan Clark, and the rest of their team. Thank you all. Finally, I want to thank Dave Forey, Nina Goodall, Bernal, and Simran Modi, our symposium editors, have gone above and beyond to help plan today's event. They did so while navigating a lot of uncertainty. For example, for a while, we did not know whether we would be hosting you virtually or in person. Thank you for your hard work throughout the last several months. In addition, the 2L members of the journal have been working tirelessly over the last several days to continue making sure that this event is a success and that every detail is executed perfectly. They are the next generation of the Emory Law Journal and I have absolute confidence that today's symposium and next year's volume are in good hands with them. Thank you for your hard work. Last but certainly not least, Sammy Harrell, the executive symposium editor for volume 71 of the Emory Law Journal. Sammy has invested an incredible amount of time over the last year into planning today's event from coming up with a vision to executing all the details of today on her own. Sammy has worked really hard to ensure this symposium is a success and we are also grateful for Sammy's dedication. Thank you, Sammy. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Sammy herself, Emory Law Journal's Executive Symposium Editor. <laughs> 
Hello all, um, I'm Sammy and I wanna welcome everybody to the 2022 Randolph W. Thrower Symposium. Um, thank you so much for being here, audience and speakers alike, even if only virtually. Um, before we get into it, I just wanna very briefly go over the conception of this event. Uh, as Emory has recently announced the John Lewis Chair for Civil Rights and Social Justice, we wanted to further honor John Lewis and um, the ideas that he worked so hard to promote, including good trouble. Um, when looking at this, we, we're inspired by the fact that often to make change or protect rights that are fundamental, an amount, a certain amount of trouble comes along with that. Um, and so to look into that, we wanted to examine and really dig deep into the First Amendment as a gateway to social justice and change and as a protector of that type of good trouble. In formatting this symposium, we wanted to encourage learning and action. Um, so with the help of the John Lewis chair himself, uh, we came up with an order that would hopefully inspire people to uh, take action after this. Um, so we're starting with look at, a look at how we learn what rights we have from the government, how we tell others, and what rights we have to protect ourselves in telling others and learning from learning what rights we have and what rights might be being violated. Then in our second panel, we're looking to and reflecting on our First Amendment rights as a nation around us changes. Um, we've certainly had countless historic firsts and, and generational marking events in just the past couple of years. And that's definitely taken and affected the way that our, we interact with the First Amendment in many ways. And we're taking time to look at that. And then finally, in the last panel, we're taking a step back to look at the day-to-day -day realities and some of the shortcomings um, of the First Amendment and where, where people, the shortcomings, the day-to-day -day realities and where people may have to adjust and realistically look at the First Amendment. Um, so finally, um, we're so excited to get into it. We have a great lineup of presentations for you. Um, and to introduce the keynote speaker, we are honored to have Dean Marianne Babinski. Dean Babinski is a Dean and an Aza Griggs Candler Professor of Law. Before coming to Emory in the fall of 2019, she was a Dean at the University of British Columbia's Allard School of Law for over 10 years. Dean Babinski is an expert in public health law and among other involvement is a past president and board member of the American Society of Law, Medicine and Ethics, and a past member of the Canadian Public Health Officers Ethics Advisory Committee. Please join me in welcoming Emory's very own Dean Babinski. Well, thanks uh, very much, Sammy, for that uh, introduction. And it's my honor and pleasure to uh, be one of those who are welcoming you to this year's Thrower Symposium uh, on the First Amendment, the gateway to social justice. You know, the law school seeks to recognize that as a national and global leader in legal education, uh, that we have a responsibility to carry out pathbreaking and influential scholarship, to offer exceptional teaching and practical learning opportunities, and most importantly on this occasion, to bring our community together to work towards securing a more fair and just society through advancing the rule of law. And the symposium, the symposium today and the thrower symposia generally have been an annual tradition that really carry out all of these important objectives. Um, and as you've seen already uh, this morning, this is entirely student run, organized uh, and um, carried out. Uh, and so although there have been some thanks already this morning, I do wanna take a moment uh, to commend these students and to recognize them for carrying out this tradition, even as we continue to suffer the continuing impact of that pandemic and developing this virtual forum for us to come together across the Emory Law community and out into the broader world to discuss these important topics. Uh, so just briefly, I will recognize Editor-in-Chief uh, Danielle Kirker Goldstein, who you heard from first, uh, the ex Executive Symposium Editor Sammy um, Harrell, who uh, just spoke, uh, and the Symposium Editors Dave Fowery, Simran Modi, Nina Gadel Bernal, and indeed all of the 2L staff members who, as you heard, have played a key role in ensuring the success of this event and who will be the leadership of the journal next year. Um, the executive, uh, the editor in chief, um, referred to the Thrower Committee. And this committee has played an incredibly important role in ensuring the success of the symposium over the year. The committee meets 
uh, annually with uh, the leaders of the journal to consider potential topics for the coming year uh, symposium and to offer their advice and support. And I'll just recognize uh, by name, uh, Patricia Barmeyer, Wilson Barmeyer, the Honorable Frank Mays Hall, Joseph Blanco, uh, Vice Dean Joanna Shepard and Professors Dorothy Brown and Fred Smith for their contributions. You've also heard about a number of staff who provide important supporting roles for today's events, Rhonda Hearmans, Tara Copeland, Kenyatta Greer, Susan Clark, and the entire marketing and communications team. I also wanna thank all of you who've taken the time to join uh, today, uh, to members of our audience, and today's uh, expert panelists and moderators who are going to be sharing their knowledge and insights during the course of the symposium. You heard at the outset that one of the goals of this year's symposium organizers was to recognize our new John Lewis Chair in Civil Rights and Social Justice. As some of you may know, uh, the law school's efforts to create this chair began in 2015 with a one and a half million dollar gift offered in honor of John Lewis, the civil rights activist and icon, who also served as a representative to Congress from Georgia's fifth district for more than 30 years. The law school completed uh, efforts to raise funds for the chair by raising an additional half million dollars by 2017. And after a uh, broad national search with outstanding candidates from across the country, successfully recruited our today's keynote speaker, Darren Hutchinson, to serve as the inaugural John Lewis Chair in Civil Rights and Social Justice uh, with Professor Hutchinson uh, joining us this, this past year. So it's my honor to say a little bit about Professor Hutchinson. Uh, there's, there are many formal things uh, that can be said as if you read his bio. He's uh, well known for the rigor of his scholarship, the breadth and depth of the impact of his scholarly work. And that work is so important, exploring inequality and intersectionality as multidimensional concepts uh, and uh, continuing to uh, shine a light on the complexity of subordination in our society. That scholarship has been published in leading journals from Yale, Cornell, Washington University, St. Louis, Florida, uh, among other places. Uh, and he has a distinguished academic career, having taught previously at the University of Florida at Levin College of Law, where is the Raymond and Miriam Ehrlich eminent scholar chair, uh, and where he also served as associate dean for faculty development. And before that, he taught at American University, Washington College of Law, Southern Methodist University's Dedman School of Law, and served as a visiting professor at the University of Pennsylvania Carey uh, Law School. His academic record includes uh, degrees from the University of Pennsylvania and Yale Law School, uh, and he has truly had a distinguished and high impact scholarly and academic career, and we are thrilled to have been able to recruit him here to Emory Law. Uh, having said those formal things, I would also say he is personally already such a force uh, for the Emory Law community uh, in his role currently as chair as the John Lewis Chair uh, and in his contributions to, to our faculty, to our curriculum, uh, to our intellectual life, uh, and to the law school achieving uh, very important goals in terms of addressing uh, civil rights and social justice uh, moving forward. And uh, of course, uh, soon we'll be uh, looking forward to his leadership of our new Center for Civil Rights and Social Justice. Uh, funded through the generous gift uh, from the Southern Foundation and announced just, uh, just last year. So, but with those introductions, both formal and informal, I know that we all actually wanna hear from Professor Hutchinson uh, and hear him speak today. Uh, so with apologies for the brevity of my remarks, uh, let me uh, invite all of us uh, to offer a warm welcome to Professor Hutchinson with our thanks to him for participating in today's Thoreau Symposium as the keynote speaker. Thank you, Dean Babinski, and also thank you to the Law Journal for inviting me to speak at this very important conference. Um, when I was asked by the organizers to help um, conceptualize the event, I was very excited that they were focusing on the First Amendment and expression rights because um, it's often neglected as a very important tool or resource for social justice movements. Many people, when they focus on law, and law is just only one piece of the puzzle, they think about um, equal protection and due process rights. But um, the First Amendment has been extremely important with respect to advancing social justice on many fronts. 
And you can think of things from the NAACP organizing in the South and facing resistance and threats from not only private actors, but also from governmental actors and the litigation that they um, launched um, to resist gave rise to some of our most important Supreme Court rulings dealing with freedom of expression and um, freedom to organize in order to um, um, express one's disagreement with society. Um, those cases can also be seen in students in high schools um, who were LGBT or um, supportive of LGBT students wanting to form um, student clubs and facing resistance from schools, the First Amendment becomes a place for them um, to um, resist the status quo and to form organizations to make the high schools and also society a better and more affirming environment. So the First Amendment is extraordinarily important. And that's why I am not surprised that currently there is a very strong counter movement to anti-racism that is directing its activity towards the First Amendment. And that is more specifically First Amendment activity engaged in by anti-racists. Now, I just wanna back up and give you the genesis of my talk, some things that were going on in society that made me think about these issues. And it really started with something that was, came out of nowhere, um, a lot of criticism of critical race theory. So um, some of you being law students and, and faculty are familiar with critical race theory, others are not. But in a nutshell, critical race theory is a body of legal scholarship that emerged formally, um, you can say it existed even before that, but formally in the late 80s, early 90s. And the goal um, was twofold. One was to um, think more critically about civil rights and doctrines such as colorblindness and the discriminatory intent rule, which limits the reach of the Equal Protection Clause, but also to um, to encourage scholars um, who were engaging in progressive legal scholarship, like the critical legal studies movement, and encourage them to think more about race and the value of rights in our society. Uh, many folks who are cynical or um, critical of the law often um, go too far in their critiques. They can dismiss the law altogether as having value for social justice. Critical race theorists, though skeptical of the law, also recognize that it can be a potent weapon against subordination. So that, those are the origins of critical race theory. And it's not the first time that critical race theory has faced um, criticism, but I was, I was sort of surprised as many people were by, um, what seemed to be coordinated attacks coming from various state legislatures, um, school boards, and, and off, actually members of Congress as well regarding critical race theory. Um, but as a, you know, as a student of sociology, um, of law and society, um, my instincts are to think broadly rather than looking at things um, at face value. And so when I saw the critiques, my first thinking was, well, what is going on here? It's not really about critical race theory. And I think a lot of people understood that because um, the attacks on critical race theory led to proposals and actually the implementation of policy to ban it being taught in public schools, but that's not really a place where critical race theory is taught in, in K through 12. Um, it's more of a college level and graduate level um, curriculum. So that alone had me thinking what else is going on here. But um, I also just, uh, my research of the proposals um, made me think that this is bigger than just critical race theory. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, my thesis is that the attacks on critical race theory are part of a counter movement to anti-racism. And I um, am calling that anti-anti-racism. 
Sorry, so let me just say it again. Um, the, the critiques of critical race theory are part of a counter movement to anti-racism, which I will call throughout my talk, anti-anti-racism. And there are at least four components to it, and they all to some extent involve um, restrictions on speech, right? So part, part of the um, counter movement involves stigmatizing the presidential election of 2020, right? Restricting the right to vote, restricting the right to organize and contest um, racism, and also stigmatizing and prohibiting the intellectual basis for um, anti-racism, which is seen in critical race theory. Now, before I go into those four themes, I want to sort of first discuss why I believe that the activities surrounding critical race theory and these other components that I'm talking about are actually part of a counter movement. All right, so what triggered the counter movement is where I want to start. And I would say it starts with um, Trump losing the presidential election in 2020. And before I get to that, I'm going to back up four years um, to his victory in 2016, which many people describe as um, a white lash. Um, by this, they mean to convey the idea that many whites were so angered by the election of Barack Obama as president that they in turn supported an openly racist, sexist, and generally pol polarizing candidate um, for president. I um, argue that there's a similar backlash that happened after President Biden was elected um, president. Now, in order to understand the racial dimensions of this counter movement, it's important first to discuss why President Trump's defeat um, would be seen as a, an anti-racist moment. Right? And that has to do with Trump being what I call a, a mascot for white supremacy or a mascot for racism. And I, I choose the word mascot, <laughs> it's an interesting terminology. I choose it because of the theater with which he um, displayed um, white supremacy, either on social media, um, but more, I guess, more pronounced in his rallies and events where he was on stage um, entertaining crowds using white supremacist rhetoric and promising to implement white supremacist policies. He began his um, 2016 presidential campaign by um, invoking racist imagery of um, Mexican Americans. He also, even before he became president, had a very long history of racial discrimination, um, probably most infamously um, purchasing full page advertisements in New York's newspapers after the, during the Central Park jogger rape trial, demanding um, the return of the death penalty for the young men accused of the crime who were later exonerated through DNA evidence. Trump actually refused to accept that they should be exonerated, saying that they must have been guilty of something. All right, so there's just a number of um, moments that we can point to um, President Trump um, sort of being propping up white supremacy, um, feeding into it. There are numerous studies conducted by um, social scientists um, polling his supporters that show that relative to Democratic voters, um, they tend to have high levels of explicit and implicit racial bias and also sexism. And so on many levels, Trump, um, Trump's victory right, in 2016 had a lot to do with white supremacy and sexism. And so his defeat right, is seen by people who support him as a threat to white nationalism that Trump represented. And so that's why um, I believe that this has triggered a counter movement and critical race theory is just one part of that counter movement and there are other activities that are associated with it. Um, and there are at least four to me. So first I would say that if the 
the fate of Trump and the election of Biden is viewed as a loss for white supremacy, then um, one way of countering that moment is to stigmatize the election itself. And so number one on the list for me is um, the effort to discredit um, Trump's loss, or to discredit the election itself. Now that started way before um, the um, election night um, reached and, and Trump was later um, announced as losing the election. We saw throughout the, the, the pre-election moment, a lot of complaints about mail-in ballots, um, many states grappling with the pandemic, um, made it easier to vote um, by mail-in ballot. And that became stigmatized in many ways, especially since um, Democratic voters were utilizing that methodology much more than um, Republican voters. All right, so even before we had election night, these efforts to stigmatize the election began. And then we saw afterwards this flurry of activity um, in litigation, um, political protests, the most graphic moment um, of stigmatizing the election or the results of the election was the January 6th insurrection, um, raiding the Capitol to disrupt um, Congress certifying the election and, and Biden's victory. Um, so a lot of activity um, directed towards uh, defeating <laughs> or reversing in the minds of Trump supporters the, the, the notion that Biden is a legitimate president. All right? And all of this is because um, his election was seen as a victory all right, for anti-racism. Now, I want to pause here and say that, um, that viewing Biden as an election, uh, a victory for anti-racism is a very complicated thing. So in many ways, Biden has a very um, troubled history with respect to race. And he authored uh, infamous crime legislation in the 90s that um, many folks um, have argued led to an increase in um, incarceration um, and mainly, you know, affecting um, communities of color more. Um, so he has a very um, sketchy history in many ways with respect to race. At the same time, however, it's very clear that um, people of color of all demographics um, supported Biden overwhelmingly and um, a coalition of people of color and suburban whites actually <laughs> delivered the victory to him. Um, an important states, Georgia being one of them, and also Pennsylvania. So in, in many respects, um, despite Biden being this moderate and having questionable anti-racist connections, he's nevertheless um, viewed uh, as such by um, um, Trump supporters and members of this counter movement. All right, and so in, along with all of the litigation, the failed litigation, right, and uh, we see efforts to suppress voting by people of color. And one of my, a good friend of mine is a political scientist at the University of Florida. After the election said, he said, we had a conversation and he said to me, watch it. They are going to start passing these laws to make it more difficult to vote. And you know, I, I agreed with him, but I, I thought that was a very insightful comment by him because that's exactly what started happening. All right, so, and it's like a chain of events. Uh, the election was fraudulent, so now we have to do something about it. And what we have to do is to make it harder for people of color to vote. And that we saw a, like a domino effect that many people called um, Jim Crow um, 2.0, mirroring some historical moments where state after state after state start enacting um, laws making it difficult or impossible for people of color to vote. We see that happening here, obviously not explicitly about race um, and not um, as prohibitive to the same extent as laws in the past, but still mirroring this moment where we have a collection of states um, where state legislatures are conservative um, on, on issues of race, 
and issues of gender and other social justice concerns and acting these um, laws across the country. Now, I want to pause here and just connect this piece to the First Amendment. Um, voting is a First Amendment activity. Uh, it, it, voting itself is First Amendment activity, but also there's a lot of First Amendment activity surrounding elections. All right, and so consistent with the theme of this symposium, I just want to just put that out there. Here is this pressure point on expression, right? Making it difficult to go into the polling place and express your preference um, for a particular candidate. It's a very old practice in US history, right? Um, to keep powerless groups um, in their place. And we're seeing it happen again. Another dimension of this is to chill anti-racist um, political activism. And this one has some very disturbing elements in it um, to me. Um, and let me just explain the connection. So this started actually before the election as well. A lot of it had to do with during the same year that we had the pandemic, 2020, um, during the same year that um, the election was occurring, we have Floyd, Amart Aubrey, and many other folks um, suffering racist violence and, and, and homicides. And the Floyd death in particular led to um, just international, global anti-racist activism. And it was just, I, historians say that this is, <laughs> there aren't that many moments that they can point to where you have this global movement, this flashpoint, that was really bigger than Floyd, that was a trigger point. But in many ways, this was about contesting anti-racism, systemic racism, and um, the almost permanent status of people of color as second-class citizens. And um, true to form, President Trump has this very um, brutal reaction to the protests, um, infamously, pulling out the National Guard um, to stage um, a photograph in Washington, DC. Um, there was a phone call he had with governors uh, across the country where he told them that they must um, stand up um, extraordinarily forcefully um, to the protesters and shut them down. And he used the facts of the protests in his political campaign. Now it ended up not um, giving him a victory but he saw that as a moment to, um, to rally his supporters in his base to the polls um, in order to contest all right, the dangers of anti-racist activism. All right, another piece of that has to do with states, um, the same states passing the anti-voting legislation, also passing laws or considering laws that would immunize um, people who drove vehicles into um, protesting, right? Um, so literally um, authorizing violence against anti-racist demonstrators. Now, the legislation in those states, successful or otherwise, does not mention anti-racist protests, but they came at a point where the connection was clear. They were going after Black Lives Matter protesters. All right, some of the peaceful protests by Black Lives Matter, it often involves um, staging events in um, roads, not always, but sometimes. And there were incidents where motorists plowed into them as protesters. And in response, states started passing and considering legislation that would immunize um, those drivers who, um, who caused harm or even death to people protesting in the streets. So the connection in terms of time was very blatant, very clear that they were going after Black Lives Matters protesters or more specifically anti-racist protesters and that this was a moment or this is a moment of anti-racism. Anti I um <laughs> And then here's critical race theory. Let's condemn the intellectual basis for anti-racism. And again, 
critical race theory um, promotes the idea that racism is systemic, that it's not just a product of individual bias, that um, neutral policies and rules can facilitate and strengthen racial inequality, and that racism is part of um, a network of systems of domination that need to be examined um, together, like sexism, um, heterosexism, um, poverty, and um, the status of people with disabilities. All right, so critical race theory looks at those things holistically, and um, but at bottom, critical race theory um, argues that racism is systemic and it is fostered by um, norms in our society that sound neutral on their face, but actually um, work to um, maintain white supremacy. So with that, we start seeing laws around the country using critical race theory as the symbol of something going wrong in our society. And, and I was struck um, by the proliferation of that movement. It, it happened very quickly. It went down to a very um, um, you know, low level of politics. So we see school boards, not to suggest when I say low, I mean, it's not, this isn't Congress where it's this national thing, but it went all around um, the nation and with white parents um, passionately um, arguing about the dangers of um, critical race theory. But when you look at the policies, and I, I wanna thank my research assistant, <laughs> uh, second year student here at Emory who uh, dug up all of these policies, you see some interesting things. And Florida is, uh, I think is um, probably um, a great example. It's a great example. Florida is actually, it mentions that you know, critical race theory can't be taught in schools, but it also bans any um, uh, teacher from um, engaging in instruction which says that racism is systemic in our society, all right? And, that, and or that racism is anything other than individual bias. Now just hold on to that. <laughs> Um, there are so many ways that you can go with that, right? So if one way um, that, that, that I think they want to go with this is to suggest that um, racial inequality is not a product of institutional bias. Instead, it's due to the failing of people of color to avail themselves of the equal opportunity that we have in society, that we supposedly have in society. Um, and, and I think that's a common theme in what sociologists call racial resentment. And essentially, we see the states codifying racial resentment as a part of school curricula across the country. So racism is individual bias, it's not systemic bias. And further, we can't even teach that the United States was founded on principles of subordination, right? Um, and that has just dramatic implications um, for speech rights, right? The First Amendment um, governs access to information. Uh, and I expect to see litigation on this if we haven't already. Um, as there are, more restrictions that can be imposed on in K through 12, but that's not a free for all. There's a lot of litigation and precedent that um, says even in schools, children have the right to access information. Um, to the extent that this stuff pours into colleges and universities, um, the First Amendment stake for faculty are extraordinarily strong. All right, and so um, I expect to see lots of litigation there. There's some precedent out of the Ninth Circuit. A few years ago, Arizona tried to ban ethnic studies and that was really about targeting Mexican Americans and Latino studies, right? And the Ninth Circuit held that that was a violation of equal protection, right? So now that was wrapped heavily with speech concerns or expression concerns but it came down to um, equal protection in that case. So I expect to see, or we, I, I, I hope that we get 
um, similar litigation around um, these particular concerns. Now, <laughs> because critical race theory um, suggests that we should um, examine systems of subordination broadly in, in an intersectional fashion, I just want to say that more recent events, right, so, uh, events that have happened since I started thinking about this piece, um, kind of confirm my thinking that this is a broad movement, a uh, counter movement um, that is grounded in um, anti anti racism, but it's bigger than that. All right, so I'm, I'm doing what Mari Matsuda, a famous critical race theorist, says, you know, ask the other question. When I see something that is racist, she says, I ask, where's the sexism in here? Um, and so <laughs> I'm asking the other question, and you look at the legislation, some of the states are banning, are proposing to ban feminism, right, in, in, in K through 12, all right? Um, so that's one. And I wanna, um, there's a recent bill pending in New Hampshire. Some of you have probably heard about it. It's a loyalty, it's a, it's a loyalty um, provision for public school teachers. All right, and so interestingly, it starts out with no teachers will advocate communism, socialism, or Marxism as a political doctrine. <laughs> um, and it's interesting how socialism and Marxism constantly make their way into counter movements to anti-racism, anti but that's a different conversation. More importantly, um, the, the second clause in the, the bill says, no teacher shall advocate any doctrine or theory promoting a negative account or representation of the founding and history of the United States of America in New Hampshire public schools, which does not include the worldwide context of now outdated and discouraged practices. All right, such prohibition includes, but is not limited to, teaching that the United States is founded on racism. All right, so this is everything <laughs> that um, critical race theorists um, believe about our society, right? Um, we were founded on very, very um, negative grounds, right? racism, sexism, and many other types of isms. And that is exactly what is being contested by this proposed legislation. But most importantly, um, it's more than race, right? It's um, about racism, but it's not limited to that particular teaching. We've seen in Tennessee recently, there's um, a school district voted to ban a book on the Holocaust um, in, in a particular school district. So this is getting broader and broader, and it's it's bigger than anti-anti-racism. It is really anti-anti-subordination. Um, so what do we do with this stuff? Well, we continue fighting. <laughs> we continue um, contesting and using freedom of expression and other tools that we have in our belt to um, to counter this movement. And I'm always, you know. Um, informed by history. This stuff has happened before. As I said during my introduction um, to this um, speech, that um, some of the earliest civil rights activity was met with brutal resistance. And so we are seeing a repetition of history, right? Um, racism is extraordinarily resilient. Um, it finds a way to come back um, to try and defeat any gain. And so drawing on history is extraordinarily important. And all of the things I mentioned that are happening today, that um, those include um, um, restricting access to voting, um, criticizing the intellectual basis of movement, restricting political activism, those are things that we have already experienced as social justice movements in the past. And it's important to, um, to, to have that context in mind as we develop strategies of resistance today. It's extremely important not to view these things uh, on face value. Instead, this is a collective movement designed to maintain subordination in many different forms. Um, but I'm encouraged by, <laughs> by John Lewis, um, extraordinarily brilliant, um, individual, who, and I am so honored to, to hold a chair in his name. John Lewis, um, in all of his wisdom, 
spoke um, very eloquently to today's generation of activists who um, were just expressed so much frustration, like we all feel, with the need to continue fighting issues that we've been fighting for centuries, right? And I, I am so moved by his response to them and, and his speeches and in his writing as well, that every generation has to continue liberation struggle. Liberation is not an event. It's not a moment that is accomplished. It is a constant struggle, he said, um, to find a way in which people can live their lives free of subordination and inequality. And I am taking that mantle um, uh, with me as I um, continue um, developing as a professor, um, as a scholar um, at Emory Law School, and as I work to develop a center along with others um, uh, um, who are also academics, but not only academics, who are um, members of community organizations um, to, to help try to get that beloved community that John Lewis um, strived for in all of his work. So I'm going to stop here. I wanna give some time for questions if, if there's any that remain. And I wanna thank again, the organizers of um, this event for taking on such a compelling uh, um, topic in such a very thoughtful way, just reading the names of folks who have been invited uh, and who are participating today. It, it's, it's just thrilling and uplifting to be a part of this event. So I thank you very much for indulging my comments and I will take questions if we have time. I, and I see a note saying, I don't think we have time for questions. <laughs> I do apologize um, if I spoke too long, but I wanted to get a lot of things out there. Um, you can certainly email me if you have questions, all right? Um, and I'll give you my email. I'll type my email in the, um, in the chats for everyone to see. So please feel free to email me and I'll answer questions um, by email. Um, thank you so much, Professor Hutchinson. Um, as you stated, I don't believe we'll have time for questions, but uh, I'm so excited to introduce the moderator of the, the next panel, Professor Matthew Lawrence. Professor Lawrence researches and publishes on healthcare, finance, admin law, and addictions. In addition to his teaching and scholarship, Professor Lawrence possesses a wealth of experience in the federal government. He most recently served as a special legal advisor to the U.S. House of Representatives Budget Committee. Previously, he worked on healthcare regulatory issues during the Obama and Trump administrations as a trial attorney in the Dep Department of Justice Federal Programs Branch and attorney advisor in the Office of Management and Budget Office of General Counsel and the Executive Office of the President. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to moderate. And again, thank you, Professor Hutchinson, for such an interesting and riveting talk. Um, I'll hand it over to Professor Lawrence to begin the first panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sammy, and uh, hello to everybody. I can't imagine a better way to spend a rainy Friday here in Georgia than uh, digging into really interesting, tough, fascinating, important issues uh, surrounding the First Amendment. Uh, I am just the moderator, so I'm going to introduce the panelists and then get out of the way. Uh, the uh, law review editors have put together a really fantastic panel uh, this morning with a really broad range of experiences uh, and expertise. Uh, so um, uh, we'll have three panelists. I'll introduce all three, and then we'll have uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, for each. So uh, the first panelist will be Barry Sullivan. Uh, he is a law professor at Loyola University, Chicago, where he is the Cooney and Conway Chair in Advocacy and the George Ant Estepalo Professor of Constitutional Law. He was Dean at Washington and Lee uh, he was also formerly a partner at the law firm of Jenner and Block, where he was co-chair of the Supreme Court practice. Um, just a, a one more note uh, for the uh, students is that uh, Professor Sullivan began his legal career clerking for Judge Minor Wisdom, 
And that's a judge that, you know, we law professors read cases and, and you hear references to minor wisdom. And, and I know, uh, Barry, that you, you're talking about other matters and we won't just ask you questions about uh, about the judge. So uh, with that, um, uh, I'll actually turn to uh, Barry Sullivan to uh, for your remarks and I'll, I'll introduce the other speakers as we get to them. It will be Aziz Hook uh, from the University of Chicago and Jerry Weber from the Weber Law Offices. But uh, Barry, please take it away. Right. Thank you, Professor Lawrence. And uh, thank you to the uh, organizers of this. I'm delighted to be here and, and uh, want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, my writing in this area has been informed by the insights of Alexander Mickeljohn on the centrality to democratic government of broad access to government information. Uh, Mickeljohn famously asked, uh, what would be the use of giving to American citizens freedom to speak if they had nothing worth saying to say? Uh, and it is likely, in my own words, not Mickeljohn's, that they would have nothing to say uh, worth saying if they lack information. Uh, in that earlier, in my earlier work, I accepted the court's view, uh, as I guess we must, that strictly speaking, there's no general First Amendment right of access to government information. But I argued uh, in previous articles that the uh, Freedom of Information Act is essentially a super statute uh, or a quasi-constitutional quasi statute that must be broadly construed uh, to give effect to its First Amendment underpinnings. There was a lot of criticism of uh, FOIA, uh, and that criticism's been from the beginning. Uh, virtually every government agency opposed uh, the enactment in 1966, and LBJ were told, uh, was dragged kicking and screaming uh, to the ceremony where he signed it and praised it. Uh, in 1974, uh, then Assistant Attorney General Scalia, uh, Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld all apparently persuaded uh, President Ford to veto the 1974 amendments, uh, which of course Congress overruled. Uh, in 1982, uh, Pres uh, Professor Scalia wrote an article in which he said that the defects of FOIA could not be overcome uh, because of the romantic notion that the first line of defense against an arbitrary executive was a, quote, do-it-yourself, end quote, oversight by the public and the press. The real protection, Scalia wrote, lay in the separation of powers in the tug and pull of the two political branches. In other words, we should put our faith in the big guys, not the little people of the public and the press. In my presentation today, I'd like to make uh, three points. First, I'd like to situate access to government information where I think it belongs, both in the context of this conference and in real life. Namely, is one of the conditions necessary for the existence and hopefully the flourishing of a vibrant, inclusive, democratic society. But as we know, there are many reasons, both legitimate and illegitimate, for withholding government information. A flourishing democratic society requires the disclosure of all information that can safely be disclosed. But it requires other things as well, which I wanna talk about in my first point. Second, I think that Scalia's framing of the issue presents a false choice. It isn't a question of whether we need the tug and pull of politics within the separation of powers framework or popular access to government information. We need both. And third, both avenues of access to government information through FOIA and through congressional oversight need repair. The first point, situating access to government information as one of the necessary conditions for a vital, inclusive democratic society starts ironically with James Madison's famous letter to William Barry, in which he writes that, quote, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. This language was quoted extensively one might even say promiscuously 
uh, by those who advocated greater access to government information uh, in the 50s and, and 60s. Uh, and it was quoted inappropriately. In fact, Madison's letter uh, addressed access to education, not openness in government. But the words, I think, are consistent, in spirit at least, with Madison's observation in 1791 that, quote, every good citizen should be at once a sentinel over the rights of the people, over the authorities of the confederal government, and over both the rights and the authorities of the intermediate governments. Madison's view of popular democratic government obviously had serious limitations in terms of who he deemed uh, part of the body politic. But he, but he envisioned within those limitations the basis for a vibrant popular government built on active and robust citizenship. The, it depends on a citizenry that is educated as his letter to Barry makes clear, but also with access to information, with citizens who feel connected to government, interested in government and care about government. They must believe that government works and that government is just. They must also, there must also be some rough uh, equality of condition as well as equality of opportunity. The gap between rich and poor cannot be too great, which is something that Madison himself recognized. There will always be difference of opinion, as Madison says in Federalist 10, but there must also be a sense of shared reality, some common ground that allows them to agree on the nature of truth and falsehood. I say this as prologue, as an acknowledgement that the First Amendment or access to government information cannot solve all our problems. They must be embedded in a vibrant, inclusive, and just democratic society. Contrary to Scalia's rhetorical flourish, I don't think that anyone ever thought that FOIA by itself would provide the first line of defense against an arbitrary executive. He called that a romantic notion, and he suggested that the real defense was the separation of powers and the tug and pull between the branches, which presumably was all that was really needed. In our time of hyperpolarized political parties, with one party often controlling one or both houses of Congress as well as the presidency, the idea that separation of powers can perform the role that Scalia envisioned seems itself a romantic notion. The fact is that both are needed and both require repair. In the time that I have left, I'll, give an, I'll try to give an example of each. The first involves in-camera review in FOIA cases. In EPA against Mink, the very first FOIA case to reach the Supreme Court, the court held that FOIA did not authorize uh, courts to look into uh, records, to conduct in-camera review of records that were requested. Congress quickly overruled that holding uh, by amending FOIA, but the issue has remained alive ever since with appellate courts constantly uh, emphasizing that trial courts may look at the records for themselves, but ordinarily should not. Trial courts probably didn't need much encouragement to follow that course. They're generally overworked as it is, uh, and I dare say that FOIA cases probably do not look like the most important cases on their dockets. Like Justice Scalia and other uh, critics now and then, uh, some judges may be biased against FOIA and in-camera review, and they may be inclined to let, quote, the big guys, quote, handle it. In addition, the records may be voluminous, and the judge may wonder how in-camera review can really accomplish much given that the proceeding necessarily will be ex parte and the judge will not have the benefit of an adversarial presentation. But we know the government lies. The modern state secrets privilege was built on a lie. And when government officials know that their declarations and affidavits will not rigorously be tested, that's in effect an invitation to lie. 
With some notable exceptions, courts generally have refused to conduct in-camera reviews and the government affidavits are not tested except for something like plausibility or internal coherence. Uh, in Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, against the Office of uh, the Director of National Security, the court rejected, DC Circuit Court, uh, rejected the appropriateness of in-camera review, holding that such review was appropriate only if the agency's declarations, quote, do not provide specific information sufficient to place the documents within the exemption category if this information is contradicted in the record and if there is uh, evidence in the record of agency bad faith. Moreover, according to the Epic Court, when the agency meets its burden by means of affidavits, in-camera review is neither necessary nor appropriate. That's quite a heavy burden for a requester who hasn't seen the records to meet without the benefit of discovery, which doesn't occur in these cases. Finally, the court counsels that the disclosure of even apparently mundane or heavily redacted materials in national security cases could pose a national security threat. Uh, as I say, some judges have, uh, have uh, engaged in in-camera review, and one that's particularly instructive, I think, uh, from my point, is a May 2021 decision by Judge Amy Berman Jackson of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, uh, which suggests it's a case called uh, Citizens for Responsibility in Ethics and Government against the Department of Justice, uh, which suggests what can happen when the judge looks at documents in camera. In that case, a public interest group sought access uh, to the records that Attorney General Barr had reviewed prior to making his public statements that the Mueller investigation had essentially absolved President Trump of wrongdoing. By May 2021, only two documents remained in dispute. The government maintained that the documents were exempt from mandatory disclosure under Exemption 5 because they were deliberative and pre-decisional. And the government urged the court not to review the documents in camera. Uh, Judge Jackson uh, did look at the documents in camera and she found that one of the documents clearly was not deliberative or pre-decisional and clearly was not within the scope of the exemption. She essentially concluded that the declarations that the government offered were false and that they never would have been uttered but for the government's expectation that the court would not look at the actual documents for themselves for herself. Uh, FOIA, so so my my conclusion with respect to this part uh, of my inquiry into FOIA is. Um, that FOIA could be greatly strengthened if the government could not count on the fact, as it usually can, uh, that the court will take its affidavits at face value and not bother to look at the disputed records. My second point has to do uh, with the ability of congressional committees to secure information from executive officials. In Trump against Mazars uh, in 2020, which involved a congressional subpoena directed at certain banks, I'm sure everybody knows this case, and uh, accountants that had relationships with President Trump, his companies, and uh, members of his family, Chief Justice Roberts noted that the case was one of first impression. The court had never before addressed a congressional subpoena for the president's information. He further observed, quoting from then Assistant Attorney General Antonin Scalia's 1975 testimony in Congress that as a historical matter, congressional demands for information had not ended up in the courts, but have le been left to the hurly-burly of politics. Of course, executive refusals to provide information to Congress have become much more numerous since 1975, with President Trump reaching new heights with sometimes categorical uh, directions that no head of an executive agency should comply with congressional subpoenas. Uh, 
In Trump against Mazars, a seriously divided court attempted to set down some guidelines for courts to follow in reviewing congressional subpoenas that seek the president's personal as opposed to official documents. Clearly, the president has standing to sue to protect his papers. Recent case law suggests, perhaps unremarkably, that other executive branch officials also have standing to challenge a subpoena calling for records within their possession. But the question is whether the congressional committee uh, can ensure compliance with a subpoena. Theoretically, as OLC pointed out in 1986, Congress could refer a matter to test, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, could uh, refer a failure to testify to the Department of Justice. But the department, as OLC uh, admitted, is not likely to prosecute an, official, an executive official uh, for contempt of Congress. Congress uh, could also exercise its power of inherent contempt, send the marshal out to arrest the non-complying witness uh, and deposit them in the Capitol basement detention center. Uh, but it hasn't exercised that power uh, for a long, long time. Just a one minute warning. Okay, uh, so in, in the McCann, we had two uh, decisions in the DC circuit uh, in the McCann case. Uh, one says that um, the House Judiciary, the first panel decision says the House Judiciary Committee uh, doesn't have uh, standing uh, to bring an action. The second uh, says an uh, in-bank decision says that it does. I'll just make one further point. Uh, so first, the law is, is, I think, uncertain at best on this subject. Judge Griffith, one of the dissenters in the in-bank case, uh, said, but the problem is timing. How do you, you there, there's delay is endemic in this area, and how do we get a, a case uh, authoritatively decided in time to provide the evidence to the committee that it needs. And there, I guess, is my uh, second suggestion for change. We need to figure out whether the committee has standing. Uh, Congress needs to give it standing if uh, it doesn't uh, now. And we need to figure out a way to get these matters decided before either the information becomes stale or Congress expires. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sullivan. And uh, I wish we had 45 more minutes that I could just ask you questions about that because it's fascinating. But I'll say to uh, those in the audience, please submit uh, Q&A and we'll have Q&A time hopefully at the end of the session. But now we have another uh, panelist. I would like to introduce uh, Aziz Huck uh, from the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Huck is a scholar of United States and comparative law. He's written about democratic backsliding, regulating AI. He's written about separation of powers, a lot of really important issues um, and award-winning scholarship. Uh, I'll say that I always love reading Professor Huck's scholarship and I always feel like I emerge a, a rung or two higher up the intellectual ladder when I do so. Um, and uh, for the students, he clerked for Judge Robert Sack of the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, and so I'll uh, uh, please to introduce uh, Professor Huck, who hopefully uh, will appear momentarily. I'm uh, I, if I think if I speak, you'll you'll see me. There you are. So uh, take I'm it there. away, uh, Professor Huck. OK, thank you so much, uh, Matt, for those super kind words and uh, of introduction. Uh, and thank you so much to uh, to Sammy Harrell and Danielle Goldstein and the other Law Review editors for inviting me. Um, I, I apologize that my the the setup uh, in my office is not ideal uh, for Zoom. Uh, the, the offices here were not uh, designed apparently uh, for people to be seen on camera. Um, it's a real pleasure to be included in this uh, distinguished group and to uh, have a chance to speak on these um, important questions. Um, I want to begin my comments by making two caveats. The first uh, is given the timing uh, of the event in relation to the paper 
uh, what I will say today is provisional and an outline of an argument rather than a completed version that dives into the details. Uh, second, uh, and maybe more importantly, I, I want to flag that I am off counsel in a civil action challenging some of uh, Facebook's uh, content moderation policies. Um, my comments here today do not reflect my role uh, as counsel. I mean, obviously, they, the, the fact that I'm counsel reflects a certain um, uh, view of the world on my part, and my comments also reflect that view of the world, but I'm not in any way, shape, or form uh, relying on information from that litigation or representing uh, uh, my clients uh, uh, in that in respect to that litigation. Okay, so in recent years, online platforms for speech, such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, have been criticized for their systemic uh, role in undermining democratic institutions and dispositions. Uh, this claim about systemic effects has been tendered by my colleague, Brian Leiter, by uh, former Wall Street Journal journalist, Paul Barrett, who now is at Brookings, and a host of other uh, scholars and, uh, uh, and think tank figures. Uh, the claim that they make is a claim about systemic effects. It's a claim about how the shared ground of knowledge, the dispositions uh, to compromise, and the willingness to avoid uh, the dehumanization of political enemies, all of which are essential to a democracy, are challenged by social media. I think that this claim about systemic effects is both distinct from the specific factual claim that manipulation of social media changed the outcome of the 2016 election. I, I think that claim is per persuasively uh, rebutted by uh, uh, the Benkler book, uh, Network Propaganda. I also think it's distinct from the important claim that social media platforms abet discrete and granular harm, such as uh, harassment, revenge porn, copyright violation, uh, or, or other such things. There is a connection between the granular and the systemic. That line will often be blurred, but I'm going to try and keep on the systemic line uh, side of the line. Now, the dominant response in legal academia to uh, these worries has been a, a rehearsal of the liberal legalist position with respect to the risk of state intervention and control of speech and the public forum. Uh, the best pieces here are by scholars such as Danielle Keat Citron, Hannah Block Rebo, uh, and Kyle Langvar. I think these are all uh, uh, terrific scholars, and I think their work has been uh, important. Um, nevertheless, I have a, a couple of, of worries about uh, this position. Um, this line of scholarship, at the same time as it uh, critiques and worries about state control, evinces a powerful distrust of corporate power. It's not entirely clear uh, what the position is that they're advancing. If they, if the, if an equal distrust of both public and private control of the public, of the of the public sphere is uh, is 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 deemed unacceptable, right? Who, if you if you distrust both the state and the market uh, with respect to the democratic public forum. Who exactly controls that space? Um, also implicit in these li liberal legalist critiques is, I think, a nostalgia for an imagined past in which public discourse was unstructured, organic, and imminent, something like the, uh, the uh, fable of the New England town hall. One doesn't need to read Habermas to recognize that this account of the public sphere is a myth. So both the scholarly literature and public policy with respect to social media platforms and their effect upon democracy seem to me stuck between a rock and a hard place. The rock is a profound concern about state control of the public sphere. Uh, this is exemplified in the, the First Amendment and the body of jurisprudence that's come from it. The hard place is a worry about concentrated private power being used to undermine democracy using the speech tools that democracy makes available. 
So here's the thesis that I want to advance in that, in that context. The thesis that I want to advance is that this is not a new debate. In its basic form, the debate about social media and its effect upon democracy mirrors a long and lively debate in political theory and comparative constitutional law about something called militant democracy. Now, there has never been much debate about militant democracy in, in the United States, largely because First Amendment law keeps it at arm's length. So my ambition with respect to these comments and potentially uh, the paper is to suggest that we benefit at least analytically and intellectually by putting aside for, uh, at least for the purposes of, of trying to understand the position we're in, putting aside the law of the First Amendment and thinking about the lessons of the militant democracy literature for the possibility of addressing structural harms to the public sphere, structural harms to our democracy that arise out of social media platforms. So what, what is militant democracy? It's an idea that is at first associated with the German emigre political scientist, Karl Lowenstein. He flees uh, from uh, the Nazi regime in the 1930s, uh, and then in the United States writes a series of pieces starting in the American Political Science Review during World War II, explaining why democracies need to take illiberal measures in response to the threat of fascism. Lowenstein's ideas are, are never taken up in the United States. They are taken up in Germany's basic law of 1949. The basic law is the uh, analog to our constitution. Article nine of the basic law uh, envisages the possibility of both party bans and individual sanctions for infidelity to the constitution. Other European countries have followed in Germany's wake adopting versions of militant democracy party bans or individual sanctions, as has the European Union. Indeed, there's a series of actions underway with respect to uh, Hungary's Fidesz government that exemplify militant democracy at the supranational level. Now, militant democracy has been uh, criticized in American scholarship, including, I should say, by me. Uh, but there are empirical studies by uh, Oxford's uh, Giovanni uh, Capoccia and, and theoretical work by Princeton's uh, Jan Werner Muller that suggests that there are conditions under which militant democracy can stabilize uh, the, uh, the larger democratic system. Moreover, the literature on militant democracy identifies a core set of difficulties in defending democracy without compromising uh, the democratic project. Uh, and I think that that work is helpful here because militant democracy or well, the problem of militant democracy turns out, in my view, to be structurally similar to the problem of regulating social media. The paradoxes and tensions embedded in both of those two projects run on parallel tracks and confusions surrounding militant democracy are in large measure confusions that are echoed in the criticism of efforts to regulate platforms. So in both contexts, the liberal democratic state faces a powerful social force on the one hand, a party, on the other hand, a platform. In each of these instances, that social force leverages speech rights for its own ends in ways that compromise the conditions in which a democracy can persist. The only way that the state has under both of these conditions to manage uh, and to tame the social formation, to make it, uh, 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 to housebreak it with respect to democracy, is to inhibit its speech, to gag its constituents, or to dissolve it entirely. These measures are, uh, in First Amendment argo, all content and viewpoint uh, discrimination. All are likely out of constitutional bounds in the United States. Um, and it, indeed, it's telling that perhaps the most uh, uh, pertinent, the most effectual, penetrating uh, effort to regulate social media platforms with democracy as a goal in mind is in Germany, where the net GZ law imposes uh, a legal requirement of expeditious content moderation on platforms on penalty of fines of up to 50 million euros. Now, militant democracy has identified two paradoxes that I think are really helpful in thinking through uh, uh, the management of social media. The first is that any policy that is well-functioning enough to recognize the need for, let's say, a party ban, 
likely won't need to implement one. That is, militant democracy presupposes a kind of institutional capacity that is precisely wanting when democracy is under threat. This is basically the concern about uh, censorship creep that runs through the literature on, uh, uh, that expresses concern about regulating social media. Uh, the second uh, problem that's identified in the militant democracy literature is a concern about identification. How do we know when a party uh, is, uh, when a party is small, whether they, were, whether they will evolve into a systemic threat? You can see the same problem with respect to uh, tweets or posts that might snowball into something more harmful. Um, but, and here's the, here's the nub, and I'll try and wrap up in the next three minutes. As the militant democracy literature has matured, scholars uh, have recognized that these are problems of time and information inconsistency, that they're serious problems, but they're not always disabling, that it is possible to engage in an intertemporal entrenchment of militant democracy norms, at least if you have high quality administrative capacity and you're able to create effectual oversight mechanisms such as politically neutral courts. Um, the literature is also moving toward the development of more supple tools consistent with a kind of least restrictive means test, usually a proportionality or thought of as a proportionality test in Europe, um, to uh, eschew broad gauge measures like party bans and to focus on targeting specific individuals um, in ways that mitigate the cost to speech. Um, the, 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 the question for me is whether these lessons about how to refine and resolve the paradoxes of militant democracy can be transposed to the context of uh, social media regulation. And I, I, what I would hope to do in the paper is to try and argue um, at that point. One final point and then I'll close. Arguments about the possibility of militant democratic regulation are often arguments about the existence of sufficiently high quality regulatory capacity uh, that is able to make um, fact-based judgments that are not biased by partisan agendas or concerning entrenchment. Um, it, it may well be that the real problem with respect to the regulation of social media is not the First Amendment directly. It is the fact that we lack that kind of profound, uh, uh, profoundly apolitical and specialized te um, technical administrative capacity. But it is at least plausible to think that the reason that we do not have that capacity is itself America's First Amendment tradition. That is, um, the First Amendment, at least in the, in the age of social media, uh, oh. may be working as its own grave digger. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Professor Huck. And uh, as a reminder to those in the audience, please submit questions and uh, we'll hopefully have some time at the end uh, to get to some of those. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce uh, Jerry Weber as our next panelist. Uh, Jerry Weber is principal of the Weber Law Office uh, uh, where he litigates constitutional, child rights, libel, media law, and general litigation. Uh, he was previously legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Georgia for 17 years and a senior staff counsel at the Southern Center for Human Rights. He clerked for uh, Carolyn King, chief judge of the Fifth Circuit, and um, Notably, uh, once chalked up an award of $440 million in an international human rights case against a Serbian government torturer. So um, uh, major victories uh, litigating some of these issues in the trenches. And um, uh, Mr. Weber, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And I'll turn to you. Thank you, Professor Lawrence. And uh, thank you to the organizers and participants in this thorough so symposium. And um, I'm going to talk about cameras. Um, our camera phones have obviously opened the world on so many levels, um, especially in the pandemic, they become a vital means for us to connect with families, friends, and coworkers. But camera phones have also proved time and time again to be a tool for the public to see how the government operates, and in particular, how law enforcement operates. And that's where I'm going to focus my attention today. 
Um, beginning in 1991 with the brutal built beating of Rodney King in Los Angeles that happened to be caught by somebody who had recently purchased a video camera. Uh, cameras have become kind of the eyes, the ears, and the truth tellers of what happens uh, with law enforcement. If you look at the Wikipedia category, filmed killings by police, you will see over a hundred recent deaths listed in that section of Wikipedia. Philandro Castile, Eric Garner, Oscar Grant, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Dante Wright, Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta, and while it was not a police cause death, Ahmaud Aubrey in Brunswick. Sadly, we know all these names. The filming of these deaths have led to protests, prosecutions, lawsuits, and sometimes too rarely to change. And I want to focus uh, just briefly on one of those cases to kind of illustrate the significance of uh, the camera. So in April of 2015, Walter Scott, a 50-year-old Black man, was fatally shot by Officer Michael Slagler of the North Charleston, South Carolina Police Department. Slagler stopped Scott for a non-functioning brake light. Scott fled. According to the officer's account, Slagler grabbed his taser and Slagler claimed that he was justified in shooting Mr. Scott five times in the back because Walter Scott was aiming a taser at the officer. Indeed, to verify his story, uh, Officer Slagler pointed to the taser that was right by Scott as the officers arrived. Things would have ended there, a justified shooting had there not been Fiden Santana filming the killing unbeknownst to Officer Slagler. Mr. Santana did not share his video at first. He later said, I felt my life uh, with this information might be in danger. I thought about erasing the video and getting out of the community, you know, leaving Charleston and going to some other place. But after he heard media accounts of what Officer Slagler said happened, he turned over his video to the family. And the video showed that Mr. Scott simply ran, was about 20 feet away, and that he did not have the taser. In fact, it showed that as Mr. Scott was dying, Officer Slagler moved a taser to near where Mr. Scott was. Because of that camera, because of Mr. Santana, uh, because of that truth, Officer Slagler is no longer on the force. He was charged with murder. He was ultimately sentenced to 20 years in prison and the Scott family settled a lawsuit with the city. Cameras matter, but they are not often well received by law enforcement. Sometimes they lead to threats to those filming. Sometimes they lead to arrests and sometimes officers seize the cameras and destroy the images. So uh, at the risk of a technology failure, I'm gonna try to, to bring us into a short um, hopefully everyone can see that. So these are the basic limits on a citizen's filming. They can't interfere with the officer physically. They can't get within the periphery of the arrest such that they're actually interfering with the arrest in that way. And they can't violate another law. For example, they can't be in the highway filming an officer citing someone because they're in the roadway and they're not permitted. But now, what do officers often do when citizens are filming? This is a list of things that officers can't do, but that they often do do. They ask for your identity. They ask why you are filming. They ask you to stop filming when you're not interfering. They delete your images. They tell you to move back when you're not in the periphery. In the periphery. They require you to give their cam your camera to them and to give them a passcode. And so this has led to a lot of litigation. These are 10 cases that I have litigated over the last approximately 10 years. This is just a, a partial list of cases involving citizens who were filming uh, that were either arrested or that were cited uh, and um, or interfered with as they were arresting police videos. And they range from Miss Anderson, 
who saw one of her neighbors being dragged down the street by a police officer, went out with a camera to film it. Uh, to Mr. Uh, Dunn, who was filming video of um, essentially disability access areas at a government building and was arrested for disorderly conduct. And Mr. Hassan, who was at a Black Lives Matter protest and was filming an arrest, was arrested himself, and then the person filming him being arrested was in turn arrested. So as you can see, this is a problem of some frequency. Now the first case from the 11th circuit was in 1988 and there a WSB uh, a reporter and a cameraman were documenting that a Douglas County Sheriff was using incarcerated persons to build a barn on his own property. The sheriff didn't like being filmed and ultimately pulled the microphone away from the camera and pushed the cameraman. And the 11th Circuit held in one of the first cases in the country that there was, in fact, a First Amendment right to film. And the 11th Circuit case law developed a number of cases in this circuit around that issue. And uh, most recently, kind of as to where we are now, uh, the case that I mentioned involving the individual who was filming disability access led to Judge Self, a, a Trump appointee in the Middle District of Georgia, saying a very simple sentence. The First Amendment protects the right to gather information about what public officials do on public property, and specifically the right to record matters of public interest. A pretty simple rule. Those were the first lines of the judge's opinion. Uh, and if you become a lawyer and you get on e-filing and you see an order in one of your cases, and that's the first two sentences of your opinion, you're gonna be pretty happy. Cameras matter, they really do. Uh, other circuits are falling in line at this point. Uh, four circuits have addressed the issue of whether there is a First Amendment right to, to film. All so far have uniformly held that there is in fact a right to film in public places, including the First Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, and the, the Ninth Circuit, and the Eleventh Circuit. But there are still problems. And some of the hurdles that we're facing in these cases are first as to constitutional claims. And normally the constitutional claims are First Amendment claims and Fourth Amendment claims. But as to those claims, qualified immunity is always a hurdle, but in particular, a hurdle in these cases, because many courts have said that if there is probable cause or in the qualified immunity context, arguable probable cause, a lower standard of any crime, such as being in the street, there can be no relief under the first and fourth amendment. That is even true, according to some courts, if there is strong evidence that the arrest was merely pretext and a means of stopping the filming from occurring. So too often, these arguments lead to officers being freed from liability, even though the arrest was in fact protectable, and even though it in fact led to a citizen no longer being able to film. So where do we head from here? Well, one thing that Congress has already done has implemented a statute, 42 U.S.C. 2000 AA, that provides some protection for those who are filming to not have their cameras be seized and their images be seized on their, their cards. Um, but we need more. Um, for example, in the city of Atlanta, uh, certain crimes like being in the street, disorderly conduct, uh, are not actionable under the city code if the primary purpose of the citizen was to engage in First Amendment rights. And that has led to decisions like the tool case of the 11th Circuit, where a officer is required to evaluate as part of the probable cause inquiry, whether the citizen is engaging primarily in the uh, activity of First Amendment activity, here filming. And in the tool case, the court found that there was not probable cause or arguable probable cause 
uh, to arrest someone where it was clear that their primary purpose was to film. Um, this kind of a notion uh, can be worked into a statute, a federal statute. Um, and I'm kind of working on what that might look like, but it essentially would provide that a pretextual arrest uh, that is designed to stop filming would not be, um, uh, would still be a, a cause of action for damages if it could be shown that certain minor offense or offenses might have had probable cause, but that there was pretext for the arrest. Um, other things that we've seen and we've been able to work out in a lot of our cases are policy changes. For example, the city of Atlanta's policy now both prohibits filming by off, uh, prohibits officers interfering with filming, prohibits officers from deleting or damaging images, and uh, holds the sanction of dismissal if an officer violates the terms of that standard operating procedure. Uh, Fort Valley also has a policy uh, in Georgia. And uh, training is now being developed in, in Atlanta, in Fort Valley, and other places, um, often integrated into body-worn camera um, training that officers are undergoing as is. So at this point, we now have seen um, that the Black Lives Matter movement has really gained traction uh, for many reasons, but surely one of those is that the public has seen the truth through these images of hundreds of black and brown people being killed by law enforcement officers and that oftentimes are just completely unjustified. Uh, the cameras will not stop these tragic killings, but they will bear witness to them and the right to film is an essential tool for that change. Um, and it will continue to flourish as a tool, but only if there are consequences for officers uh, who have violated that right. Um, and if I can, I've got, I think I've got enough time for uh, one video that I'd like to show that um, illustrates this issue. So we're gonna, it's very short, it's a minute video. And this is Mr. Hassan at a Black Lives Matter protest. That is not him. He is filming that arrest. There he comes, he's filming. I can't see the video right now, Jerry. Oh, I'm sorry. You got somebody arrested right here. I can hear it. Okay, I apologize. I think you need to stop sharing your screen and then reshare just the video screen. Okay. Stop, stop sharing. We'll try again. Does this work? No, you're still sharing your file viewer. Okay. Instead of sharing that, could you share just like the screen where your video appears? Um, I, I will I, I will probably wave the white flag at this point, um, but uh, we will make it available for, for folks to see. I'll, I'll just make it available. I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jerry. And um, you had me reflecting on Emmett Till and the, that, the, the power of, kind of sight and, and visuals in, in bringing things to light. Um, can I ask the panelists to gather here uh, for uh, questions and answers? I think we have a little bit of time. Um, and uh, and before we jump in uh, to questions from the audience, I wanted to first ask if uh, any of the panelists have questions for each other. Uh, and if not, I'll have something. Not, not jumping in and feel free at any point. And, um, uh, Professor Sullivan, I don't see your camera. Um, if you're able to turn on, that would be great. Uh, let me say what my question is, and it's it's I think for all three of you to turn on Professor Lawrence. So for some reason, it's stopping me from turning on. Okay, well, hopefully we can uh, get the technical assistance to allow you to turn on, but we can hear you. And I'll say, uh, Barry, you kicked off my question because I worked. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to government access to information and FOIA. Uh, when I worked at the Justice Department, I handled FOIA cases. And I can defend, and I can I can imagine the government's thoughts on some of these issues, and I think it cuts across some of the presentations. And so, just to be devil's advocate in the spirit of the day, 
Um, uh, the, the thought of someone, I think, in government would go something like, first, we don't want a state, we don't just want a state that doesn't hurt us, we want a state that helps us. And second, um, there are bad actors who get the power in government, and there are good actors who get the power in government. And then third, sometimes transparency stops the bad actors, but also stops the good actors. And for the lawyers in the audience, I think what that argument has in mind is the attorney-client privilege. The reason our attorney-client notes are privileged is the idea that we couldn't do our job effectively if we knew it was all going to come out in litigation. And the argument of people in government, or that I, that I, the the devil's advocate argument, I think is um, when you when you have transparency around government, or maybe even police work, um, uh, you are going to. Yes, get the bad actors, which is great, but you might also stifle the good actors and they would say, why don't you just get rid of the bad actors another way, vote them out or appoint them out, uh, but let us good actors do our work. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that's the argument. Uh, and actually, my, it gets to my question for all three panelists, which is one upshot of that would be to say, well, either transparency good or transparency bad. But another would be to say, can we tailor our rules based on the context? Uh, maybe sometimes, you know, cameras would be okay, but not. Uh, maybe FOIA could be tailored where certain industries or certain actors would have enhanced FOIA rights. Uh, or even going to Aziz's talk, he talked about maybe we could even have different kind of First Amendment rules as applied to parties or platforms that we think are particularly concerning or something like that, that kind of tailoring function. And I know that the First Amendment is generally suspicious of that kind of tailoring and wants, uh, you know, across the board rules. But I'm curious in each of your domains, what you think about, you know, arguments to tailor to limit the rights in some places where they're less needed, uh, or maybe even uh, expand them in others where they might be more needed, um, uh, or, or just generally on that theme, then maybe fight any of the premise too would be would be terrific. So I'll turn and maybe in the uh, order you spoke in or whoever wants to jump in, um, curious thoughts. Well, I'll, I'll go first. Um... You know, I, I guess I have uh, an innate suspicion of anybody who says, trust me. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of what the Justice Department does in these cases. Um, I, I actually had a, a case uh, that I was appointed in many years ago, uh, a FOIA case that went to the Supreme Court. And, uh, and the government was so concerned about it, uh, about other FOIA issues uh, that they conceded essentially um, that I was right in my interpretation of, of FOIA in order to get Congress to uh, to do something else to suppress uh, disclosures in, uh, in another area. Um, but apart from that, I, I think that there is justification for tailoring. I think that there's justification for looking uh, more closely at, at how FOIA actually works in practice, uh, you know, the fact that we're, you know, my focus has been on government information that is uh, of uh, widespread interest to the public. Uh, we know that most uh, FOIA requests come from high-priced lawyers for, for uh, private entities. They don't come from public interest groups or, or groups representing the public. So, yeah, I think that that kind of tailoring, I think, you know, one criticism of FOIA is that it's so expensive. It creates so much expense for the government. Uh, yeah, let's let's make people who can pay, pay. Uh, so I, I'm I'm uh, open to a lot of uh, uh, a lot of um, improvements to FOIA. Uh, but my focus in, in the presentation today was was really about in camera review and about the fact that, um, that the government resists in-camera review constantly. Uh, judges have their own reasons for not wanting to do it. And as a result, FOIA is a lot less effective than it would be if we had more openness to in-camera review. So I think that Matt's question is, is getting at uh, the following dilemma. Um, you can think about the doctrine that has emerged under the First Amendment as an effort to sort between instances in which a, a line is drawn by the government 
in ways that index uh, a concerning motive to suppress or uh, otherwise malignly control speech, as opposed to instances in which the government draws a line or defines a boundary around uh, impermissible speech in ways that are either meant to uh, advance uh, and enhance uh, speech rights or uh, uh, achieve a goal that's uh, orthogonal to, uh, to one side of uh, the, the ambition of a robust uh, speech environment. Uh, this is basically Elena Keegan's point in a, a, one of the first law review articles she wrote about First Amendment doctrine. The, the problem arises because the doctrinal categories that the First Amendment employs to, to identify and therefore to sort between uh, bad and good government regulation, bad or good in the sense of aiming to suppress or aiming to enable democracy, enable uh, human flourishing and the other, whatever other goals you think the First Amendment is supposed to uh, advance. Those doctrinal lines, because they're thought of as constitutional, are relatively inflexible and insensitive over time. Uh, moreover, they're written by a court, uh, which is a, a body of limited uh, competence that draws with respect to the creation of those rules upon a cabined body of uh, material, right? The, the, the cabining has become uh, more intense over time as the court has become more originalist. And there is no reason to think, there is no reason to think that the actual line that separates dangerous from enhancing state regulation is inflexible over time or insensitive to circumstance. And there is no reason to think that the, uh, the kind of homolytic historical reasoning that, the, uh, that a court engages in is the optimal or even a, a broadly feasible way to identify the right lines. So to my mind, what Matt's uh, question nicely raises is the more profound question that um, in, at least in our system of constitutional review, of uh, judicial review of constitutional questions, we've made certain assumptions about uh, uh, the stability of prophylactic, pro-democratic regimes over time. We've made some assumptions about relative institutional capacity uh, we've made some assumptions about relative uh, invulnerability to partisan capture, none of which are plausible. So um, I would push back Ma Matt's question from a question about are these the right lines to a question uh, that I at least associate with the legal process school, which is, do we have the right institution drawing the right lines? And I, I think that that, that brings the, uh, the question back to the the points that I was trying to make about uh, institutional capacity and its relationship to militant democracy. And, and I think I'll, I'll answer the question kind of in a, in a narrow sense as to my topic. Um, there are really two aspects of limitations, one of which I think is entirely permissible and one which is not. And the first of those is if citizens are filming and they are either physically or by proximity interfering with an arrest. And certainly that it is appropriate for that limitation to apply. Uh, what I've focused on in my talk is the second uh, limitation that has occurred in the case law, which is um, where the officer is engaged in a pretextual arrest. And that pretextual arrest is justified because there was probable cause for some minor offense. And uh, Mr. Toole's case really illustrates this. Mr. Toole was filming an arrest. Um, and as he was in the process of doing that, an officer comes up to him and says, get out of the, the road. And he says, I'm not in the road. Then she starts grabbing his camera and his camera shows that he was not in the road. Um, the pretextual basis for the arrest was that he was in, an road, in the road, which was factually untrue. But the real reason for that activity was to stop the filming. 
And so uh, it really goes to kind of the fundamental principle of the First Amendment, which is viewpoint discrimination. I mean, content discrimination, discrimination based on subject matter is a no-no almost all the time in, in First Amendment analysis, but viewpoint discrimination, literally trying to silence a particular view uh, is the least tolerable thing other than maybe a prior restraint in the First Amendment realm. And pretextual arrests are just that. They are viewpoint discrimination. And so um, some sort of legislation or policy change around that issue is, is critically important. Terrific. And I want to go to uh, questions from the audience. And uh, one that uh, I'll, I'll insert just a sort of an interruption before getting it in response to some of the things the panelists said. The court could be the ones drawing the lines, uh, or uh, Professor Huck was getting at, maybe someone else would. And I'll just note the Office of Special Counsel is sort of a First Amendment independent agency for Hatch Act violations. And you could imagine having agencies that, uh, like a FOIA inspector general or a camera inspector general that made sure there was access or also chose when it was okay to limit access or something. And I just want to put that on the table. Um, uh, Jiminique Rogers asks, uh, one common theme across the panels is reflected in Jerry's use of the term truth tellers, and certainly finding truth is something a lot of people are worried about. We consistently see information provided about publicly relevant issues that is not consistent with provable facts. Absent camera footage or valid FOIA disclosures, how will the government know enough to determine what is true in our present context? Uh, and I'll open to any of the speakers, Jerry's mentioned there, but anyone who has thoughts about how the public is supposed to know enough to determine uh, for themselves what is true. I, I think that that leads into the disinformation problem, uh, especially in, in the area of social media. Um, and I was recently involved in a panel uh, where one of the speakers uh, suggested, what if social media, rather than having these dopamine inducing uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, instead had only a space for questions. And how would that change the sort of structure of social media that has created, I think, one of the biggest threats to the First Amendment right now, uh, which is this dopamine inducing yays and nays uh, that are utilized by Facebook and others um, as a um, tool for advertising. Take that away in a content neutral way um, and instead, um, and hopefully do that by agreement uh, of the social media companies. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree that there are gray areas and social media exacerbates those gray areas. Can I, can I hop in here? Um, I, I would reframe the question as not being about when and how the public or the government can know about the truth value of a particular claim. Uh, and I would focus instead upon whether and how uh, either the public or the government can make judgments about uh, uh, the disposition and qualities of the institution making the claim. Uh, and I, I would, I think that the, I, to my mind, the values that matter the most are the values identified by the philosopher Bernard Williams in his book, Truth and Truthfulness, which, are, which he calls accuracy and sincerity as the person trying to in fact work out what's happening in the world and are they in fact trying to um, act, uh, sincerely report what they what they learn uh, and here's why that's why i think that those uh, background values are more important um, i think all the time we rely upon facts that we actually can't verify so I, i'm sure that many people or at least some people on this in this conversation have small children i have small children and I had to decide whether to get them vaccinated. I'm in no position to decide or to determine for myself whether the, the Pfizer vaccine that eventually my kids took uh, will hurt or help my kids. But what I can do is I can look at who is making claims about the vaccine and I can make judgments about their accuracy and sincerity. I am in a good, pretty good position to do that. Um, so to my mind, what matters not less, it, 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 or I, I'm not, I, I am much less concerned with, can I directly work out the truth of some particular statement? Um, my, what I'm really concerned about is the accuracy and sincerity of the, uh, of the speakers. And indeed, I, you know, just to build upon what Jerry has been saying, um, you know, uh, 
a large part of the problem of regulating police is that we have that I, I you know notwithstanding the tone of this conversation i think in the general culture there are profoundly conflicting cultural accounts of the sincerity and the accuracy of the police there are very very different uh, uh, models that float out there and that we occasionally partake in of whether police have the right kinds of dispositions. Um, and at some level, the conflict over, over something like cameras is, is this really fascinating example to me of, of the fight over how we imagine the police and in particular, how we imagine their sincerity and their accuracy. Anything else to add? Or uh, I, we have four minutes left, so I'm going to put two related questions on the table, and then ask maybe each speaker to give any thoughts uh, on them. One is from uh, uh, Susan uh, Suresh Budram, who asks, "How do you believe developing technology like everyone having a video camera on their phone will affect the government's policy on the public's right to know?" So, folks on de developing technology and how it changes things. And then the other question is from Joseph Hale, and says, "Are social media platforms any worse than yellow journalism?" from the early 1900s in terms of inflammatory speech, half-truths and distortions. And I'll say, I take those questions to ask, you know, are we in a special moment and are things changing in special ways or have we been here before and these are these are old songs? Uh, and uh, let's kind of uh, conclude maybe with, with thoughts from each of you and uh, uh, on that. I, I'll start just very briefly. I, I, I teach a First Amendment class at Georgia State Law School, and I've, it's always been kind of simple for me to talk about the marketplace of ideas, and uh, it all felt very sort of sitting by a fire and warm and cozy. Um, and um, the technology changes now have really led me to a place of questioning my ideals around the First Amendment more than I ever have. Um, and I think I really struggle, and the primary source of that is disinformation, uh, primarily coming from social media, but from other outlets. Um, and um, this whole notion of there's no such thing as a false idea. Um, it, 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 I mean, at, at, at this point, I think the First Amendment has some growing to do, and it is because of the technology changes. And I certainly don't know the answers, but I, I, I now have embraced the problem. I, I, my view is that technology makes an enormous difference. Uh, it, that I would analogize, analogize it to the changing technologies of warfare. At, at the beginning of the 20th century, one of the most important developments in the dynamics of colonialism is the development of the machine gun. Uh, the machine gun makes an enormous difference. The, the, the possibility of a, of, a, of a firearm that does not re need reloading between shots makes an enormous difference to both uh, uh, the possibility of colonial domination and the cost that's imposed through its imposition. Um, so technology clearly, clearly makes a difference, even if an advance, even if ex ante, it's often difficult to tell what that difference is going to be. Um, to my mind, the, the principal difference that, that the emergence of both social media, but also more broadly, big data technologies imply is um, uh, the dramatic upscaling of, uh, 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 of, of many to one interactions which involve an imbalance of power. So uh, social media is important because it, it dramatically scales up the, the, the audience and dramatically increases the possibility of contagion or viral ideas. Right? Um, correlatively, um, the, the possibility that, that uh, here's, a, here's a thought about sort of camera phones and the film that's on camera phones. Um, and it illustrates this general point about one to many and scales. So I'm, I'm working on a short paper with a man who used to be the general counsel of the uh, intelligence community of the United States. And one of the things he points out is, you know, look, when we go and talk to a private company, they're usually willing to share whatever, you know, data banks they have. They don't, they don't need us to go and get a subpoena. They're, you know, we're the, we're the intelligence community. We're helping them uh, defend against cyber attack. So all of that film, all of that camera footage that's on the phone 
is not just an instrument for the control of by citizens of the government. It's also, at least under present regulatory circumstances, available to the government. And that availability has a kind of, it, 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 it takes widely dispersed data and it concentrates it in a single entity. And I think it's quite plausible to think that whatever effect, uh, you know, I think Jerry's work is really important, but, and, and it clearly has an effect on, on the actions of state, act, uh, uh, the behavior of state actors. But notice that exactly the same underlying data is going, is, at least has the possibility of being aggregated at the level of the national government and deployed against people in ways that we don't know yet. And that is why I think technology makes a difference. Well, I would just add that um, I think technology clearly makes a difference for all the reasons that have been stated. Uh, but I think that we also have to recognize that there are other changes in society, some of which uh, are produced by technology, but some of which are independent from society. Uh, such as uh, distrust of expertise. I think that that's one uh, area in which uh, was started to make headway uh, long before we had the technology to make it viral. Um, and, you know, I, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago on, um, on democratic conditions. Uh, and I think that there's been an erosion of some of the other requirements uh, that are necessary for a vibrant and inclusive flourishing democracy. Um, I would just end by saying that uh, I think that General Marshall got it right when he, in a radio address announcing the Marshall Plan, he said, you know, democracy demands the most of citizens of any form of government. Cool. Terrific and great way to end it. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists. And uh, let me say to the audience that uh, this, you know, ends our first session. Uh, there'll now be a lunch break, uh, as I understand it, from 11 to 1230. The organizers can tell me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, and sorry to those of you whose questions we weren't able to get through, but the editors have been very deliberate about building the day. So panel two will be First Amendment rights in a changing America. And then panel three will be making your voice heard the efficacy of the First Amendment. So there'll be opportunities to let these themes kind of develop uh, and um, and hopefully ask those questions in new forms uh, if you have them. So with that, I will see you all very soon. And thanks for participating in this panel. Constructed so that um, everybody's on board. Hello, all. Um, I know people got a little taste of what's to come, but uh, I wanted to welcome everybody back. Thank you for attending in the earlier session. Um, and I want to, we're, we're so excited for the afternoon session. Um, welcome back again to moderate the second panel. We have Professor Michael J. Broyd who is a professor of law at Emory, um, the director of the SJD program and Berman Projects Director at the Center of Study of Law and Religion at Emory University. He's also a core faculty member at the TAM Institute of Jewish Studies at Emory. Um, and he'll take over and kick off the panel. Thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you very much, Sammy. It's my pleasure to be the moderator. Nobody joins panels like this to hear from uh, the moderator, that I uh, know of for sure. The order of our speakers today is Professor Berta Hernandez Trial will speak first, um, and then Professor Tabitha um, Abu Al Haj will speak second, and then Professor Justin Hansford will speak uh, last, and um, and I'll serve some questions and answers um, at uh, uh, after all three speakers have spoken. Um, Professor Berta Hernandez Trial currently holds the Stephen C. O'Connell Chair within the University of Florida Levin College of Law. She is truly an internationally renowned human rights and constitutional law scholar who uses her interdisciplinary and international framework to promote human rights and well being all around the world. She remarked to me before that she's going to be focusing on 
an aspect of religious freedom, and I very much look forward to hearing her remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, kind uh, introduction and good afternoon. It is my pleasure and honor to be at the Emory um, Law Journal's symposium. Uh, before I start my comments, I want to thank Sammy and the journal members uh, for my invitation to be part of this timely gathering. And I wanna give a shout out to my dear friend, Darren Hutchinson, whom I miss terribly. In discussing assembly rights in the changing America, I will mention assembly, but with a twist. First, I will look at what I read as two very recent assembly decisions decided on free exercise grounds, perhaps to open the way for the court to take additional steps in expanding the free exercise clause. That expansion has resulted in erosion by the court of other civil rights and sets up one of the most divisive and contentious constitutional issues of today, rights, R-I-T-E-S, versus rights, R-I-G-H-T-S. I fully embrace the First Amendment role as a shield for important rights, freedom of expression, assembly, and religious beliefs, but I reject its recent evolution of sword, wielded to eviscerate, if not totally erase, other rights. In the second part, I will present how other jurisdictions have resolved rights versus rights tensions, from those decisions, we derive four principles that provide useful insights regarding an analytical approach when religion collides with other fundamental rights. Taking lessons from abroad and in search of a solution to rights conflicts that promote justice, I propose an awakened paradigm. First, let me briefly explain the idea of awakening the law to attain justice and that I started developing in 2021 during a sabbatical. The general concept of awakening is the idea of attaining a critical consciousness. The concept is widely embraced and has been developed in the context of religion, psychology, education, sociology, but is wholly lacking in law. Across disciplines, awakening entails questioning the status quo, often by listening to and analyzing narratives and counter narratives and asking questions. A legal awakening would seek justice. It would analyze, question, and reject inequities and take action to eradicate them. In questioning the status quo, awakening explores hierarchies of power to ascertain whose narrative and the status quo confirms and whose it erases. Awakening recognizes that everyone is guided by what I call perceptual playbooks, a collection of systems of beliefs, cognitive scripts created and passed down by families, religious traditions, cultures, the societies in which we live, as well as by law and legal systems. Each of our perceptual playbooks is imbued with ideas, theories, and tropes that define us and our viewpoints. And those are not always justice-based, as we have seen with George Floyd and the disparate health outcomes in the pandemic on grounds of race, ethnicity, and economics. Thus, it is important to underscore that consciousness is different from intentionality, as many intentional actions are unjust. Consciousness is a path to justice. With awakening in mind, let's turn to the First Amendment, which provides a shield from government interference with or imposition of religious values. Recent Supreme Court jurisprudence, however, has converted the First Amendment into a sword that by giving primacy to religion, eviscerates or erases other fundamental liberties when rights collide. The protection and elevation of religion is in flux. In January of this year, Justice Gorsuch, during oral arguments in Sherlock versus Boston, referred to the principle of separation of church and state that dates to the early 19th century and is found in Thomas Jefferson's personal writings and as I, I quote, quote, so-called, end quote, separation of church and state. Two recent Supreme Court rulings on the right to religious assembly are telling. In both Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn, uh, New York versus Cuomo, and uh, a couple of other cases that, that were combined, and Tandon v. Newsom, cases using religion to challenge gathering guidelines issued to fight COVID spread, a majority made it clear that its interpretation of free exercise required governments to provide greater latitude to religious assemblies over secular ones, solely because of their religious nature. As Justice Kagan's dissent in Tandon artfully put it, such a position disregards both law and facts alike. Both the longstanding law of treating religion 
equally, not preferably, and with the facts regarding what is required of a society during a health emergency. Indeed, in tandem, one of a growing number of cases decided in the so-called shadow docket, the court adopted the most favored nation theory of religious exemptions. It held that government regulations are not neutral and generally applicable, and therefore trigger strict scrutiny under the free exercise clause whenever they treat any comparable secular activity more favorably than religious exercise. To be sure, there is ongoing debate about whether the secular activities used for comparison were comparable at all. First Amendment jurisprudence recognized a play in the joints between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. However, in recent years, the court, often to strident dissent, has profoundly changed the relationship between the religious institutions and government by holding that the Constitution requires the government to provide funds directly to a church. It also has concluded that no aid clauses discriminate based on religious status rather than religious use. Another example of the elevation of religious rights over fundamental rights is the Fulton County case in which SCOTUS unanimously held that Catholic charities could discriminate and did not have to include married couples of the same sex in the list of potential foster parents. A couple of years earlier in Masterpiece Cake Shop, the court avoided resolving the tension between equality and freedom of religion. The court second guessed the findings of the State Commission on Equality Rights under a Colorado anti-discrimination law and concluded that the commission showed, quote, hostility towards religion, end quote, because one commissioner stated that the sad yet historically accurate truth that, quote, freedom of religion has been used to justify all kinds of discrimination throughout history, end quote. The truth of the commissioner's statement notwithstanding, the court determined the commission failed to employ neutrality. Lest we think this is a thing against LGBTQ, and more so Baru, the court wholly deferred to a parochial school dismissal decision challenged on age discrimination grounds by accepting without interrogation the school's designation of the teacher as a minister. Was she? You tell me. She was a lay teacher, not ordained, and her only responsibility that touched on religion was teaching the subject from a workbook from which she could not deviate as part of her assignment to teach a particular grade. Indeed, Justice Thomas in concurrence went further, suggesting that religion clauses require civil courts to defer to religious organizations' good faith claims that a certain employee is ministerial. And everyone is familiar with Hobby Lobby, in which the court concluded that for-profit corporations are persons entitled, based on religious belief, to, uh, to refuse to provide contraception coverage required by the Affordable Care Act. In reaching its result, the court disregarded the rights of the woman affected who did not share religious beliefs of the corporation, but was prevented from having access to contraception. Similarly, in Little Sisters, the court concluded that rule promulgating procedures creating religious exemption conformed with requirements. Justice Kagan and Breyer questioned whether the exemptions would be able to survive administrative laws demand for reason making. And Justice Ginsburg, in a blistering dissent, focused on the rights in collision and noted that the decision, quote, jettisons an arrangement that promotes women's workers' well-being while accommodating employers' religious tenets and instead defers entirely to employers' religious beliefs although that course harms women who do not share those beliefs. She urged that a balanced approach of the past would be better. The litany could go on, but the direction of the court's religious trajectory is patent. Religious rights triumph over other fundamental rights. How can we resolve the tensions and still protect all rights and achieve justice? This is where I turn to the international sphere as it's instructive to look at how others have struck a balance. International and foreign decisions provide some useful light. Um, insights. International documents afford parallel protections to the liberty interests of the 5th and the 14th. It's not surprising because the United States was a leader in imagining and creating these systems, and so its values are imbued in the documents. Specific protections of religions exist. For example, Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights that provide freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations such as infringing on the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. Beyond international law, courts approaches to resolving rights and conflict are instructive. One case in the European system directly raised the issue of religious exemptions from non-discrimination norms 
in the context of the firing of a public servant who refused to register civil partnerships. The court said she's a public servant. She has to comply with her law. It was she who discriminated, not the government, in firing her. And the European Court on Human Rights upheld the UK's decision. Foreign law decisions are interesting source of analytical possibilities. For example, in the context of public service, courts in Canada, France, Hungary, and the United Kingdom have rejected claims of religious exemptions from observing laws of general application by civil servants. With respect to private entities offering public accommodations, the United Kingdom and Canada have concluded that once anyone enters the marketplace, private entities such as beekeepers could not discriminate. They cannot rely on religious beliefs to discriminate. And in two cases, one from Canada and one from South Africa, courts have concluded that religiously affiliated institutions cannot discriminate in employment on the basis of sexual orientation, which hugely contrasts with uh, the US approach, uh, not with respect to sexuality, but with respect to age in uh, the morrison Peru case. In fact, states around the globe recognize ministerial exemptions only for those who perform ministerial functions with regards to religious institutions, a much narrower view than Morrissey. Given the increase in tensions between religion and persons asserting privacy, intimacy, and equality rights, these path markers together with the principle that once religious rights stop when exercising those rights harms others' fundamental rights, we can articulate four principles concerning resolving the conflict. One, discrimination by public servants should be strictly prohibited as it's tantamount to discrimination by the state. Two, private service provides providers offering public accommodations or doing business in the marketplace must abide by general laws that forbid discrimination. Three, except in exceptional circumstances such as the Catholic seminary not having to accept women as they cannot be priests, even religiously affiliated institutions once open to the public have to obey general laws. And four, Lastly, religious institutions and in performance of their ministry are free to discriminate based on their religious tenets, such as, again, the Catholic Church not having to ordain women. Religion and other fundamental rights are all high order constitutional and human rights. Learning from the signpost when two significant rights clash, the answer is not to elevate religion above all rights. This affects an erasure and denial of the fundamental rights of others. Rather, the resolution should aim at protecting all rights. A justice-centered awakened paradigm grounds one foundational value, human dignity, a concept that captures the uniqueness of the human spirit. It also has three pillars, multidimensionality, a layer that allows the identification of locations of bias, considering all aspects of a personal identity and all rights involved. Two, anti-subordination, an analysis that interrogates and identifies hierarchies or hierarchical assumptions. And three, anti-marginability, a holistic analysis that exposes points of marginalizations or vulnerabilities. Dignity and the three pillars provide a framework that guides in the resolution of conflicts while respecting significant constitutional and human rights values. The awakened paradigm enables the consideration of the legal concerns in the context of the factors and features of each conflict. The contextualization allows for just deliberation about all the rights affected by the decision making in any case where rights collide. Let's take, for example, to conclude, Fulton County, in which the court, notwithstanding a contract to the contrary, receipt of public funds and state law prohibiting discrimination concluded the Catholic Charities, a religiously affiliated institution, was within its rights to refuse to place children for fostering with married couples of the same sex. The Fulton County Court, unsurprisingly, put its weighty thumb on the side of the religiously affiliated institution. Surprisingly, it was a unanimous decision. Unsurprisingly, the decision is asleep. It replays myriad lines from the dominant perceptual playbook. It elevates religion over all other interests, and it ignores and erases all other rights and interests. It entrenches marginalization of the marginalized. It perpetuates vulnerability. It preserves hierarchies of power. Significantly, those whose interests are erased are not normative. Children who need homes and non-heterosexuals, groups who are viewed as less than, as outsiders, as undeserving others. It is easy to recognize the decision's failings across all the elements of the paradigm. 
It offends the dignity of many, including the children whose best interests are ignored and will languish in foster systems and be deprived of a loving home, as well as those who want to form families and be foster parents. The court's decision is an affront to anti-subordination principles, as it subordinates all interests to religion and ignores that while religion is a right at issue, so are myriad other liberty rights, including equality, privacy, formation of a family that are, if not trammeled, erased. An awakened paradigm would look not just at the religious rights, but also at the liberty rights on the other side of the constitutional calculus, including marriage, family, best interests of children, parenthood, some of the most important liberty interests within the ambit of the constitution. The awakened analysis would have brought the ignored rights to the table and would have brought the children and potential parents to the table. The proposed paradigm would expose all the elements and include the counter narrative of exclusion, subordination, myopia of rights. It would deliberate the problem with all the information before it and would solve the concern in the pursuit of justice. It will return the rights and ideals of the First Amendment to affect justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was wonderful. Um, we look forward uh, to questions at the end, comments and conversations. Professor Abu El Haj, please, you're up next. Hi, everyone. Um, I too wish that we could have all met in person, but I'm very pleased and honored to be part of this symposium and this panel um, in particular. Oh, dear. So I am going to um, talk today about um, the First Amendment um, and the right of assembly. Um, and um, as many of you might have noticed, First Amendment protections for protesters and for others who seek to gather in public on the streets for religious, sorry, for political purposes um, are not strong. Um, that was, I, I was thinking about um, the previous, uh, 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 Professor uh, Hernandez's point that religious assemblies are getting more protection and that those might um, uh, mess up there for political purposes are not strong. And um, these weaknesses, I think, manifest in various ways, um, uh, including in the pol policing of the anti-racism and police violence protests in the summer of 2020. And I think um, uh, fo following um, on a theme brought up this morning by Professor Hutchinson, um, we also see a First Amendment backlash in the context of the right of assembly because in the wake of those um, Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, we've seen a flurry of anti-protest legislation um, passed mostly by Republican, actually exclusively by Republican legislatures um, aimed at criminalizing um, disruptive uh, protest. So um, I actually want to set that up as the sort of background, but today what I want to focus on is the doctrinal root of the problem, um, uh, which um, is the way that the court has collapsed um, the First Amendment rights of assembly and speech into one another, creating a sort of free expression doctrine in which speech reigns, um, and um, and the way that um, uh, and the costs of doing that. And and so one way of thinking about this, in my mind, is that um, protesters are experiencing the First Amendment as this weak shield because of a differential that the doctrine has created between protections for speech as compared to public assembly. So um, I'm sure many of you will remember from your law school days, Brandenburg uh, versus Ohio, um, the, the decision where the court held that the government may not prescribe words in the absence of a credible and imminent risk of violence. Um, but one of the things um, that I, is important is that the court has never made a similar declaration with respect to public assemblies. The Warren Court, even as it threw out various convictions of civil rights protesters for trespass um, and other disorderly conduct sorts of crimes, 
um, repeatedly indicated um, that the right of assembly did not per se protect what I would call nonviolent but disruptive protest. So it always reassured states that had those protesters broken the law by, for example, obstructing traffic or failing to have a lawful permit, they could have been arrested as individuals or dispersed as a crowd. Um, in that regard, I think one of the pieces that um, of this puzzle about well, where we are right now is that the court has balked at every invitation to hold that an imminent risk of violence is a prerequisite for authorities to disperse those gathered in public or to arrest individual protesters at public gatherings. Um, uh, so one way I like to talk about this is that the First Amendment has been construed to protect disorderly expression, offensive expression, but not disorderly conduct. Um, and this refusal to create parity between the protections of the freedom of speech and of peaceable assembly um, are what I would argue leave individuals who exercise their constitutional right to gather in pu public vulnerable to official caprice. As we saw, most of the protesters um, who gathered in 2020 and really throughout history have been peaceable. If you look at sociological studies, nonviolent, um, uh, yet um, that does not mean they are orderly always. Sometimes they are disorderly. And at the same time, um, uh, especially since Occupy, we've seen um, police officers um, uh, routinely um, arresting um, individuals or dispersing crowds um, because of this gap. Um, uh, and then dismissing the charges after the fact. So one thing you might say is disorderly is in the eye of the police holder, of the police officer in this um, governing um, uh, legal framework. Um, and this legal framework also has given the legislatures um, who have been passing these anti-protest um, uh, provisions confidence or a measure of confidence an argument that their bills are constitutional. Okay, so that's the current situation where we're at in terms of the rights, where we're at in terms of the doctrine. I wanna talk about the irony of this settlement, um, the, this settlement between strong constitutional protection for freedom of speech, but weak protection for the right of assembly. And I wanna say the irony of this settlement cannot be overstated, particularly um, uh, for, uh, people who take seriously the idea that we should um, think about constitutional rights in terms of text and historical record. That, that not, might not be me, but that I think is a lot of the legislatures passing these, um, these anti-protest um, measures. So first of all, the text of the First Amendment explicitly protects the right of the people peaceably to assemble. The clear implication is that the right does not cover gatherings of the people that are the opposite of peaceful. And generally in the English language, the opposite of peaceful is violent. Um, and indeed there is evidence um, that at the time of the adoption of the amendment, the term peaceable was not intended to be confused with the term legal or permissible. And even more clearly, when you look at the historical record, mostly in state courts, because the First Amendment was not incorporated against the states um, uh, um, until the 20th century, um, you see that the constitutional shield, because this right of assembly didn't come out of nowhere, but was part of a tradition, um, uh, only disappeared when assemblies descended into riot or unlawful assembly. And an unlawful assembly is a term of art. It did not mean a law assembly that was not legal. It meant an assembly that was a predicate to a riot. And the common law definitions of these two crimes were narrowly construed by American courts to apply only to violent crowds. And the level of violence that they tolerated was quite high. This was the 19th century. There was generally more violence. Um, so, now, by contrast, historical protections for the freedom of speech were narrow, in fact, I would say shockingly narrow um, uh, uh, from a contemporary perspective. Those very same courts routinely allowed for the suppression and regulation of a range of things that we just take for granted from um, blasphemy to obscenity 
They even struck down music. They didn't really think music was protected. Um, even uh, fighting words, um, uh, profanities, and actually sedition. There was a big debate. Um, uh, in fact, the only clear indication of what was prohibited was advanced censorship of the press, prior restraints, although the, the anti-sedition stuff um, do, does emerge at least as an argument early on with the anti, with the Democratic Republicans pushing against the um, Alien and Sedition Act. So there's a lot that we could discuss about the above, um, but the point of that was really just to sort of bolster my argument that there really should be this comparable protection. I agree, actually, that in the speech context, the line should be violence, but I actually am pushing that for the right of assembly, the line should also be violence. Um, and that if we, and that there's a payoff um, for beginning to uh, apply the right of assembly as an independent doctrine, um, uh, because I think it would clarify um, a whole number of things. Um, one thing is that I think it would help those individuals who are out and about exercising their right of assembly peacefully um, to have more confidence that they will not be arrested or dispersed if the line was clearer and we talked about it in terms of assemblies. Um, but um, I also think it would help us with an issue that's emerging as American politics are back to being highly polarized and as counter demonstrations are on the rise, which is how do we police this line between an, a protected, a constitutionally protected assembly and a riot or, or an unlawful assembly in that classic sense. Um, and so what I wanna highlight here is that currently the protesters that most benefit from the doctrinal setup in which all the analysis is about speech are actually violent protesters. So the cases that are emerging or coming um, out of the participants in the January 6th riot at the Capitol or members of the Proud Boys and the, who organized and brought weapons uh, to the Capitol. Um, other cases involve um, members of militant white supremacist groups that showed up at the Unite the Right protest and at other protests and committed acts of violence. Um, and an individual um, who recorded himself um, looting and encouraging others to loot on the first night of the George or I think it was the first night of the George Floyd protests in Minnesota. And I think this is ironic that the free speech doctrine is creating some set of protections for these violent protests and violent protesters, since I think no one, however progressive or liberal, would argue that violent protests, and here I mean attacking law enforcement or looting, um, is constitutionally protected by the right of assembly, though to be sure some people might make an argument that looting might be, um, uh, uh, you know, understandable, but not, no one I think would say that was constitutionally protected. Okay, so the illustration I want to use of this phenomenon, um, and I just want to check on the time I have, which I think will be good, um, it, are these recent First Amendment challenges to provisions of the Federal Anti-Riot Act. So a number of individuals who have engaged in violence at public assemblies have been charged by the federal government under the Federal Anti-Riot Act. Um, the act prescribes um, traveling in interstate or foreign commerce um, or using a facility of interstate commerce, which includes the mail, telephone, and by implication, the internet, to, quote, incite a riot or, quote, organize, promote, encourage, participate in, or carry on a riot. Now, the statute then goes on to define riot narrowly, consistent with what I've described as the common law, understanding where you needed to have acts of violence or a clear and present danger of violence to persons and property. And it is also explicit that the incitement and organization provisions, while they include speech, such as urging or instigating other persons to riot, should not be uh, deemed to cover to mere written or oral advocacy of ideas or beliefs. And in all of the cases that I've seen, there's no question that the participants actually engaged in um, violent or riotous behavior. Um, nevertheless, these defendants have urged 
that the statute is overbroad because it prohibits a substantial amount of protected speech. Basically, the argument is that organizing a riot requires speech, so all of my organizing speech should be um, uh, protected. The, in the United States versus Rupert, for example, the defendant argued um, that the statute was overbroad because a substantial amount of protected speech and, quote, conduct like organizing necessarily associated with speech was um, caught up by this. And a shocking number of courts have been persuaded. The Fourth Circuit in the United States versus Miscellus accepted that the Anti-Riot Act was overbroad insofar as it prescribed organizing, sorry, encouraging or promoting a riot um, uh, on the grounds uh, that encouraging and uh, promoting uh, would sweep up a substantial amount of speech covered by Brandenburg. Um, but it did draw the line at organizing on the grounds, and I'm quoting the court here, that speech tending to organize others to riot consists, consists not of mere abstract advocacy, but rather of concrete aid. Now, the Ninth Circuit went further, and the Ninth Circuit actually struck down the organizing um, uh, a provision as well. So in that case, the case involved a different self-professed combat ready white supremacist group called Rise Above the Movement, RAM. Um, uh, uh, this time what they um, exploited was that time gap between when the defendants' organizing speech happened in California, as well as all their organizing activities, and the violent acts that they actually undertook a plane ride away. And they argued that under Brandenburg's incitement standard, um, they couldn't be uh, meet that, that the, the federal government couldn't meet that standard because all of their organization had not been imminent in time to the violence that actually occurred. In other words, their speech did not incite an imminent riot, it just prepared and organized for it. And the Ninth Circuit bought it, um, uh, uh, finding that the term Organize is similarly overbroad, like urge organize is not susceptible to a limiting construction that brings it with Brandenburg. The Ninth Circuit only upheld one word, instigate. So from my analysis, from my perspective, this analysis gets everything backwards. And this sort of slicing and dicing the words in the statute is not really the way to be thinking about this. The basic problem is that the court has collapsed these two distinct rights. But if we take seriously the independence of the First Amendment guarantees, as I have been arguing in my scholarship for years, we could simplify the analysis um, by saying um, the first question should be, is the public assembly that uh, emerges protected or not protected? Because the First Amendment actually does, on its face, protect one form of conduct, at least one form, public assembly. Um, peaceable ones are protected by the First Amendment, ones that are violent are not. So then rather than asking whether there is any speech associated with the unprotected conduct, which is essentially what the courts are doing, we should actually ask the threshold question whether the conduct, the assembly, or the acts of the individual was protected by the First Amendment at all, um, and if the answer is no, then the speech necessarily associated with organizing it would also not be constitutionally protected. Rather than asking in the first instance if there's any speech that might not meet the Brandenburg standard. Um, I think this would really help us at this particular moment um, because it would help those protesters on the right and the left um, who really are exercising their First Amendment. Um, uh, activities, even when they are offensive to others. And it would also um, not create the situation where the government gets to say, well, look, we have to have broad discretion because there's going to be this violence and then we're not going to really be able to um, uh, uh, criminalize activity that really should be criminalized. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious of time. And so I am happy to answer more ab about that. Um, but the last point I wanna make before stopping is really that of course, the key to making this work is for the courts to define the right of assembly broadly. Because my approach only works if you really say assemblies that are 
nonviolent are protected and others are not. Um, uh, if the court, if courts stick around with the suggestion that any form of Ill illegality in the conduct of a public assembly um, sort of checks it out of First Amendment protection, then of course, um, protesters would be um, no better off. Um, so with that, I, I think these are super important questions at this moment where we're seeing more polarization and more political violence and also a backlash against the First Amendment in this particular context um, to begin to sort of offer arguments um, as we engage in a political struggle, which I think we are in, to defend sort of some of the basic premises of um, the First Amendment and liberal democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Abu El Hajj. It was wonderful. Um, Professor El Hajj is a leading expert in the First Amendment, and I didn't introduce her to begin with because I wanted to combine the two introductions to these next two presentations, but also because her presentation allowed us to understand that she really is a leading expert in the First Amendment, and this presentation shared with us why. Professor, Professor Justin Hansford is, the Howard, is a Howard University School of Law Professor of Law and the Executive Director of the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center. Um, he is a leading scholar um, in um, these kinds of First Amendment areas, and we very much look forward to his presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen, uh, which hopefully is visible to you now. Uh, give me a thumbs up if this is visible somewhere. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. So uh, I'm going to speak briefly about uh, as many of the same issues that the previous speaker covered in her excellent presentation specifically the First Amendment freedom of, of assembly when it comes to race. As you can see, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. I first became interested in the subject when I was a protester in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, uh, protesting uh, the, the killing of Mike Brown and the subsequent actions of the Ferguson Police Department and prosecutors. Uh, but we know that this has been an ongoing issue that has been perhaps most recently um, brought to light in light of not just the, the 2020 protests and the January 6th uh, uh, riots that took place in, at the Capitol, but many people commented on the disparity in the response of police to those two assemblies. And uh, <clears throat> that has also continued to raise this question of race when it comes to Assembly, and I should, should clarify what happened in my arrest here was that I was serving as a legal observer. You can see the yellow, or excuse me, the green, neon green hat I was wearing. I was one of five legal observers at this um, protest and uh, the only black legal observer and the only legal observer arrested during that time. <laughs> so we see this, this question of disparities that our previous speaker uh, raised as well, and it, it has often led us to consider the role of race in the policing of assemblies. And uh, this this uh, little uh, <laughs> uh, sentence might apply in, in in many people's eyes: censorship for thee, but not for me. Um, I've written written an article saying that, in my view, in fact. The First Amendment freedom of assembly often works as a racial project. And what I mean by that, uh, I'll, describe, I'll discuss more throughout this uh, short presentation over the next uh, 12 minutes. <clears throat> so you, you, as you see, I'll talk a little bit about the history, talk about the role of critical race theory in my conclusion when it comes to the role of race in the First Amendment freedom of assembly jurisprudence and uh, also, we'll talk a bit about some of the things happening uh, today on the ground. As you can see, and of course, this is the subject of our symposium today. Uh, so we're very well familiar with this uh, amendment here. Uh, there's no reference to race, of course, and it's, it would seem to be a 
uh, amendment that would be uh, very difficult to parse from the perspective of racial justice. However, here's, a, here's the, uh, one of the founders of critical race theory, Derek Bell. And uh, one of the theories that he created, I've argued is relevant to our understanding of how the First Amendment works in the context, in the context of assembly. Uh, one of his core theories is the theory of interest convergence. In short, the theory, and this is a very uh, stripped down version of the theory. In short, the theory says that principle of interest convergence provides the interest of Blacks in achieving racial equality will be accommodated only when it converges with the interests of whites. And uh, he uses his analysis of um, many historical uh, uh, instances of racial reform to demonstrate the reality that these episodes, in fact, depended on uh, socio-political, socio-economic contexts in which the benefit of the racial reform did not just go to the minority group, but, but also went to the majority group in the United States. <clears throat> Most famously, he applied this analysis to the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education case. Um, now, in some, some of my work, I've discussed how this lens helps us to understand the broad sweep of the First Amendment as it developed over the course of the civil rights movement. Um, many prominent scholars, uh, Professor Clavin and others have discussed how the civil rights movement was in many, in many um, from many perspectives, a turning point in the uh, evolution of the First Amendment. Um, after uh, Brown, you see NAACP versus Alabama, a case in which this, the state of Alabama sought to essentially uh, uh, terminate NAACP activities in the state by demanding that NAACP members uh, hand over their membership roles to the state so that they could then uh, move forward in uh, persecuting those members. The Supreme Court supported the NAACP in that case, upholding the freedom of association rights of the NAACP members. So that, that was the one of the first times that the, that the Supreme Court dipped its toe into the dis dispute of civil rights on the grounds of the First Amendment and upheld the rights of the NAACP very soon in Boynton versus Virginia, um, a case for involving around the sit-in movement. Uh, there were young students who were arrested for sitting in lunch counters um, at a, uh, a lunch counter at a railroad station. And the court found a way to overturn those convictions of those protesters, not on First Amendment rights, uh, excuse me, not on First Amendment grounds, but on um, grounds of uh, revolving around the Interstate Commerce Clause, but still upholding the rights of civil rights protesters. And then even in uh, Cox versus Louisiana, uh, this was a situation in which um, there was a protest near a courthouse where the Supreme Court upheld the rights of civil rights protesters throughout 1965 overturning local Louisiana convictions. So we, we saw a, a positive trend that through the, throughout the process of the 60s expanded what seemed to be the space for civil rights protesters to engage in freedom of assembly. But then we saw a sharp turn in 1966, which coincidentally was, or not coincidentally under my theory, was, was the same year that the Black Panther Party was founded in Adelaide versus Florida. We saw protests shift from protests against segregation, which were, were the Boynton cases and the Cox cases, to more so protests against police brutality, protests that were seen as more militant. And then uh, <clears throat> Adel in the Adelie case, the convictions were upheld. And even in uh, Walker versus City of Birmingham, we see the court no longer taking this view of accommodation towards civil, civil rights protesters. Uh, so I, this, this idea of interest convergence is one in which uh, we can explore how, if this theory is correct, how did it affect this uh, line of cases? Was it the case that once the United States, as, as was described earlier, had already decided for political reasons that they wanted integration, they supported uh, integration protesters, but once those protests turned to other areas that were not 
integration-based areas like police brutality, that interest convergence was no longer present. And we saw the withdrawal of the uh, protection for the, the civil rights protesters. So is this theory something that would be something that can guide current protesters is one question I always like to discuss and I'd be happy to discuss afterwards. But in, in, in this context, if you look at the civil rights movement, we ended with Walker versus city of Birmingham which is a famous case involving Dr. King and his protests in 1963 leading up to the uh, passage of the Civil Rights Act. In the, in the absence of a principled First Amendment jurisprudence, uh, Dr. King, as we all know in the letter from Birmingham jail, discussed many of the uh, theoretical questions that continue to dog protesters unto today uh, when do you? When is it ethically defensible to break the law? When are laws just laws or unjust laws? And these types of discussions around uh, deciding when to acquiesce to unjust laws or when to engage in civil disobedience continue to be dis debates that happen in the legal context. Uh, Harvard professor Charles Freed disagreed with Dr. King and felt that once you start breaking laws that were passed in a democratic environment. It's a slippery slope. Uh, but uh, even um, Howard Zinn, who is a, a famous uh, historian in the area of social justice, disagreed with Dr. King in his perspective that you could only break those particular laws that were uh, unjust, but not the laws uh, that were just. So for example, you could, you could break segregation laws but uh, you would have to be more circumspect around breaking, say, a, a trespass law in the context of that. And you would always need to turn yourself in in order for that law breaking to be just. And Howard Zinn disagreed with the prospect of turning yourself in for the breaking of a trespass law. So I just, I raise those questions because I always like to uh, direct my comments, not just to the scholars and the attorneys, but also the protesters, especially in the, in the context of the First Amendment freedom of assembly. And there are moral questions that are relevant to our legal discussions here. So, uh, secondly, as we revisit the First Amendment, uh, looking back at the jurisprudence once again, I do want to raise the question of the strict scrutiny applied to any possible uh, regulation that would include the question of race when it comes to the First Amendment, especially in the context of uh, assembly. We were very familiar with the strict scrutiny uh, approach to understanding the, the First Amendment and how it compares to other ways of analyzing First Amendment uh, issues. But as we know, there are many situations in which uh, the court does not adhere to this idea that strict scrutiny must be applied to all laws that are not seen as content neutral. Um, however, outside of libel defamation, you know, um, other, other areas where we, we see the principle of content neutrality uh, as something that does not bound, uh, bind the Supreme Court, we don't see that departure when it comes to race. And I do want to proffer the possibility in light of some of the things we've seen with Black Lives Matter, whether or not we can conceptualize the, po the possibility of a race conscious law around the question of freedom of assembly being found to be constitutional. Uh, again, so if we look at the, the history of our First Amendment jurisprudence on the grounds of race, uh, it is a, a history that would be surprisingly to people I think uh, a mixed history is not, it is not a, a history that developed in a straight line. There were ups and downs and different directions taken by the Supreme Court. Of course, many of us are aware of some of the more recent cases and all of you as First Amendment uh, scholars and law students are familiar with some of these major cases. Of course, Virginia versus Black and Rav versus the of St. Paul, um, uh, you know, overturning statutes designed to criminalize the burning of crosses in St. Paul, Minnesota, <clears throat> or in uh, Caroline County, Virginia, 
However, Virginia versus Black finding that those um, statutes could be seen as constitutional if the burning of the cross was shown to be done with a intent to intimidate. Uh, so this was a this was a turn that is generally seen as a a uh, very uh, you could say our most recent uh, interaction between this question of race and hate speech and the First Amendment. But prior to that, the court has gone through different phases. In Colin versus Smith, we saw the a debate around an assembly that was one that was organized by the um, the far right at the time, neo-Nazis. Uh, and in that case, the statute that was passed in this uh, small town that was a predominantly Jewish town to try to avoid the presence of that protest, that statute was overturned by the, by the court, uh, finding that you did have to allow that assembly, echoes of, of Charlottesville, uh, where, we've, where this, once again, the First Amendment was not uh, able, for, because of the adherence to the principle of content neutrality, to allow the, the regulation, the effective regulation of a neo-Nazi assembly. But this has not always been the case. Uh, if, uh, if you go back to 1952, in the aftermath of uh, the World War, the Second World War, we had a case in which there was an, an individual who was distributing handbills that were uh, handbills designed to uh, intimidate and promote hate speech against African Americans. The court upheld a statute that criminalized the, the distri distribution of those handbills, saying that this idea of colorblindness in the context of the First Amendment, content neutrality in this analysis being seen as comparable to colorblindness, this ideal was vacuous. This is the, these are the words of the court. It would be errant dogmatism for us to deny that the Illinois legislature may warrantly, warrantably believe that a man's job and his educational opportunities and the dignity accorded to him may depend as much on the reputation of the racial and religious group to which he willy nilly belongs as on his own merits. The court here um, using this, this quote to justify a principle that someone, that some, some scholars would later on dub as the principle of group libel. Going back to our exceptions to content neutrality, we know that libel. Is a, is a situation in which the content of a regulation is not enough to necessarily put the, the regulation under the analysis of strict scrutiny. And the court here is saying that that principle of libel could be applied to a group like a uh, African-American or Jewish American group that would then be brought in, under the umbrella of a doctrinal area called group libel. Uh, this was the 1952 case that has, has been in question. Uh, it, its continued vitality has been questioned by uh, Supreme Court watchers ever since. But it does show that the court's jurisprudence on this question has not been direct. So there is a possibility, which I would love to discuss, of a uh, type of regulation that could be used to regulate assemblies that are going to involve hate speech, specifically on the grounds of something along the lines of group libel. So that's, that brings us to today, and I want to discuss um, the passage of anti-protest laws around the country. Um, I, I actually would like to share a, uh, another screen here very briefly. Um, there is a organization which I'm, the part of, I'm a part of of the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law that has created a protest law tracker. And this protest law tracker um, allows us to uh, watch in real time as we see the evolution of, uh, let's see if I can find a way to share a screen here. Uh, as we see the evolution of efforts to suppress certain types of speech, certain types of assemblies, 
and not others. Um, and, I, and I'll come to a close in one second here. So if you, you see this, you may see that there are uh, laws that are being passed around the country, uh, stripping pandemic aid from individuals convicted of protest related federal crimes. This is a, a bill that is pending on the federal level. Uh, many have been, def been uh, defeated on the federal level, um, but we, we have seen on the state level in places like Alabama, uh, laws being passed to do so many uh, different uh, types of regulation that is included for example, even uh, providing protection for those who might run over protesters who are blocking the street. Uh, new penalties, enhanced penalties for protest related arrests. Um, new justification for using deadly force near a riot. So you can visit this website to find out more about what's happening on these uh, state on the state level and even federal level um, efforts to regulate protests. Very few of these efforts have in any way, shape or form sought to regulate the types of protests we saw in Charlottesville or even on January 6th that are protests that involve hate speech. We do see protests that are uh, for really the Black Lives Matter protests continuing to be criminalized. So I will stop there. I, I know I'm up on time, but I thank you for the, the time. I'm looking forward to the discussion and um, thank you for the opportunity to, to be a part of your symposium. Thank you all very much. I'd welcome questions from the audience for a minute or two if we want to ask any. We've really essentially run out of time after three really spectacular, spectacular presentations. Um, but if anybody wants to use this as a chance to ask a question or two, um, I would welcome that. Hi, um, Professor Boyd, we do have a few questions in the q and I think we have time for we're running behind schedule, but I would love for you all to give an answer. Um, if you would, you like me to read one question and then we can move along. Yes, please. Who wants to ask a question? Okay. Um, I have one question here from Simran. It's how can racial justice movements safely and effectively mobilize in the future? Um, if you guys could speak to that briefly before we move along. Thank you. So, um, one, um, I, I would leave to Justin some um, probably more practical responses, but one thing I actually want, have been thinking about is that I think it's important for um, uh, activists um, in the racial justice movements and on the left to begin to push for legislative changes in cities, which have a lot of control over these municip municipal um, uh, ordinances that give police discretion. And we've seen the sort of anti-protest legislation by Republican legislatures, but I think on the, on the left and among progressives, people tend to be more focused on courts as our saviors. And I think we're at this moment where finding protection for progressive movements and for racial justice movements really might need to start um, uh, statutorily um, and um, to make sure that those um, crimes are are limited to um, violence and um, and imminent threats of violence or to even just have exceptions to say like you can't really apply disorderly conduct during a first amendment um, uh, protected or permitted you could simplify it a permitted assembly or something like that but I think there might be some ways to at least stake out some ground here um, uh, through municipal and state legislation. We have time for one more question, but we really don't want to intrude on the next panel. So please, if Berto or Justin want to take another crack at this question, that would be great. No, let's, let's, have, let's have one more question while we still can. Okay. Wonderful. I think it, uh, it's important not to intrude on the next panel. Thank you all very much for participating in this panel. Thank you to our wonderful speakers.
<clears throat> it was really a wonderful event. Very well done. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. And to the people whose questions have gone unanswered, I know that there is an option to answer questions through the chat, um, which the panelists have the option or the ability to do. Uh, please feel free to answer those questions so, uh, in that way. Can and I ask I would... a question, Sammy? I, 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 I have a note that I can't enable my video feed because the host has stopped it. Yes, um, the host will allow that when your panel begins, which is just now. Um, awesome. Just briefly to introduce the next moderator, we have Professor Mary Mary L. Dudziak, uh, who is an Ada Griggs Candler Professor of Law at Emory University and a leading legal historian um, and a US in the world scholar. She's past president of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, an honorary fellow of the American Society for Legal History and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as well as many other wonderful um, accolades. To introduce and moderate the next panel, we have Professor Dudziak. Thank you. Um, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I would like to um, start by thanking the audience for um, your persistence here today. And um, it's been such an honor to be part of this conference. And I have to say <clears throat> uh, to also sort of sit in on uh, the last speakers who I so deeply admire. Um, I'd like to briefly thank um, the um, uh, Sammy Harrell for her um, brilliant work in organizing and executing this conference. Um, uh, uh, the uh, um, editor in chief of the Law Journal, uh, Danielle Kirker Goldstein, and all the staff, every single one of you um, of the Emory Law Journal, for your hard work, dedication, and incredible professionalism uh, during this difficult year. What, what a wonderful job you have done. I'm so proud of you. Um, so I will inter introduce, sorry, I'm going to talk fast because we have so little time and so much to do. I'm going to inter uh, introduce the speakers very briefly uh, in the order in which they're going to um, speak. Um, for question and answer, we're going to try to save time for you. And please use the Q&A function, not the comments. Um, so our first up, all of these speakers are internationally renowned experts, and we are honored uh, that you have joined us today. Uh, we'll start with Seth Kramer, who is the uh, Kenneth Gamel uh, Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania, where he has taught constitutional law and related subjects for four decades. Um, he has published very extensively in the field um, and has also served for two decades as chair of the legal committee of the Philadelphia ACLU and regularly serves as co-counsel in free speech cases. When you have to count things as, as de in decades, you know you're talking about pretty serious expertise here. Um, we'll then hear from um, Az Azada uh, Shashahani, who has worked extensively in the U.S. South to protect and defend immigrants and, uh, uh, and uh, Muslim, Middle Eastern, and South Asian communities. She previously served as the president of the um, National Lawyers Guild. Um, her many awards include the Sh Shannara M. Gilbert Human Rights Award, my personal favorite, um, from the Society of American Law Teachers, and another favorite, the Emory Law School Outstanding Leadership in, the Pu in Public Interest Award, um, also the American Immigration Lawyers Association Advocacy Award. Um, then we'll hear from uh, Dawn Carla Nunciato, who is the William Wallace Kirkpatrick Research Professor at George Washington University Law School and co-director of the Ethical Technology Institute. She's the author of, among the other things, Virtual Freedom, Net Neutrality, um, and Free Speech in the Internet um, Age. And amazingly, she's chair of the TikTok Content Advisory Council. Um, she's written and lectured internationally um, on, on speech and information privacy. So please um, start us off, Professor Kramer. So thanks very much for the very kind introduction. I'm not sure whether four decades is cause for wisdom, but at least it gives me a, a perspective uh, to approach these things. Uh, can people see the, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint? Give me a thumbs up if you can. 
the PowerPoint is small in the corner. It's it needs to be um, expanded. Okay, I so believe. let's see. Better. Uh, the I think the square in the upper right of the PowerPoint. Uh, if you want to get a you there want you to go. get a full I screen think... like that, does that, does that help? Yes. Okay. So, uh, when I started teaching constitutional law uh, and the law of the First Amendment four decades ago, uh, the First Amendment doctrine, uh, First Amendment doctrine, uh, was deployed by the Supreme Court during the 1940s uh, to protect the labor movement, and after uh, repudiating the red baiting of the 1950s. Uh, the, as, as Professor Hansford pointed out, it moved towards protecting the movement for social change associated with the civil rights movement. Now, I'm inclined to think that the protection uh, did not evaporate with Walker against City of Birmingham. Uh, if you look at the PowerPoint, you can see all the way down to NACP against Claiborne Hardware. Uh, and in an overlapping area of protection, uh, the Supreme Court protected the anti-war movement in a whole series of cases. Uh, importantly, uh, the Supreme Court uh, protected each of the, the phases of citizen-driven social change. It protected the right to organize. It protected the right to protest, publicize, and disseminate information. It's protected the right to mobilize into action. Importantly, the court not only protected each of these links in the chain uh, from criminal prosecution, but it constrained non-criminal sanctions and limited the ability of governments to deprive organizers of channels of communication uh, that facilitate public contention. Now, by contrast, in the 21st century, particularly since the appointment of Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito, uh, many observers have begun to view the Supreme Court's First Amendment work as a redoubted reaction. Uh, notable First Amendment cases have entrenched plutocracy, have minimized democracy, have protected business interests, have weaponized the First Amendment against labor, LB, LGBTQ rights, abortion rights, and public health. Uh, our last panel discussed some of that. Uh, now, these eye-catching cases represent a broader set of trends. A full census of the Roberts Course First Amendment work product from 2006 to 2021 reveals that among successful Supreme Court litigants, more than two thirds come from the coalition of right wing interests, businesses, Christian organizations and individuals mobilizing against abortion and LGBTQ rights, right wing activists. Indeed, if you exclude idiosyncratic individual plaintiffs, more than nine out of 10 winning cases involve the vindication of the claims of right-wing litigants. Now, does that mean that the Supreme Court is no longer an ally of citizen-driven social change? Over the years, I've been active in assisting the litigation of the Pennsylvania ACLU. And it continues to seem to me that the First Amendment is an important tool for, for potentiating citizen-driven change. It protects organizers and demonstrators against arrest and harassment. It assures access to public forums. It protects the rights of citizen observers to record the actions of public officials and particularly police. Now, to try to determine whether or not my perception is parochial, when I was invited to this forum, I worked with a research assistant uh, to survey uh, over a thousand reported lower court, lower federal court cases in which the First Amendment was deployed between January 2020 and August 2021. Uh, I didn't read all of the cases, only a thousand, uh, which was essentially every other month. The result when you look at it, supports my experience. Unlike the Supreme Court, where two thirds of winning litigants came from the right, uh, in the cases that did not involve employment, and I put those to one side because they usually had a series of other claims like Title VII 
uh, claims that, uh, that, that that kind of obscured the First Amendment activity. So putting aside the the the, uh, the employment cases, uh, roughly speaking, uh, twenty six percent of winning litigants came from the right, and thirty three percent came from first um, from classic First Amendment claimants. If you limit the sample to right versus classic, uh, the numbers are even more striking. Uh, the fact is that the First Amendment remains an important tool on the ground in, in, in reported cases for claimants challenging the status quo from the left. Now, what accounts for this? I have three thoughts. First, the classic First Amendment protections for organizing, persuading, and protesting are good law. The Supreme Court continues to cite and deploy cases from the Golden Age. Almost every one of the important cases that protected uh, the rights of protesters and uh, organizers during the 50s, 60s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s has been cited in the last 10 years. These cases need no new work from the Roberts Court in order to be deployed at the firing line. They stand ready to be invoked by the participants in the citizen-driven change. So the fact that the right is winning in the Supreme Court doesn't mean that these doctrines have evaporated. Second, the current Supreme Court has brought to the center of its doctrine something that has been a part of First Amendment discourse at least since the 1960s, the idea of equal treatment and, and content neutrality. This means that lawyers seeking to defend or facilitate social, uh, citizen-driven social change can deploy doctrines developed by the current Supreme Court on behalf of litigants from the right. One example from my own experience, uh, in, in 2018, the Supreme Court decided a case called Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky. Uh, it was brought by right-wing activists who wanted to wear t-shirts uh, uh, announcing they were Tea Party Patriots and uh, a button that said, please ID me at the polls. Uh, the Minnesota uh, uh, polling officials invoked a rule that prohibited political attire at the polls. The Supreme Court uh, held that that was unconstitutional because the definition of political was so broad that it granted local officials effective sensorial power. Now, a year later, the Pennsylvania ACLU was approached by the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, that wanted to challenge a decision barring them from running advertisements on the buses uh, in the Philadelphia area, highlighting the, uh, the center's findings of discrimination in the local housing and mortgage markets. I have up there one of the panels they wanted to run. The Transit Authority refused to run the ads because they were, quote, political under their regulations. Uh, we brought suit last year. The Third Circuit agreed that the ban on political ads on buses is as improper as a ban on political attire at the polls. Uh, a decision that favored right-wing litigants in the Supreme Court was successfully invoked at the firing line. Third, uh, in my sample, more than one in five cases where progressive litigants succeeded in the lower courts involved protests. And here, I think I'm a little more optimistic than some of the speakers on the prior panel. Uh, not all of the claimants won, uh, but ha in half the cases, the claimants did in fact succeed. In most of these cases, uh, judges reviewed video evidence. And I think this is an important element of the world in which we live. The emergence of video verification has facilitated organizing by agents of citizen-driven social change by allowing them both to widely expose injustice to the political sphere and to confront potentially skeptical trial judges with reality. Judges exposed to evidence can transcend their prejudices. 
Now, one last point on doctrine. It's worth noting that in my sample, uh, the left-wing claimants deployed two doctrines that have not yet reached the Supreme Court. Uh, first, lower courts regularly recognize a right to obtain and record evidence regarding public issues. Uh, this protection works in parallel with the right, uh, the power of video verification. And I gather, though I'm, I wasn't able to see it, that the first panel spoke about this. Uh, this is an important uh, protection, particularly in uh, working synergistically with existing doctrines. Second, lower courts in the sample uh, both protected electoral organization and required authorities to adjust rules to facilitate electoral participation. In a number of these cases, the Supreme Court ultimately stayed them, but others were viable and protective. Let me close. I want to emphasize that the First Amendment only opens doors, and it doesn't always do it in a timely fashion. The forces of reaction can step through those doors. Today, as in the past, lamenting the forces of reaction or their success before the Supreme Court is not a strategy. The moral here is that courts can often help but it's only with the hard work involved in seizing the opportunities the First Amendment preserves that citizen-driven social change can succeed. To borrow the words of Joe Hill, don't waste time mourning, organize. Um, thank you for P Professor Kramer, um, who gets the conference award for ending early. Um, and so now we'll, we're going to turn to Ms. Shashahani. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I would um, like to thank uh, the students at Emory Law School for organizing uh, this conference. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, thank you also for the kind introductions. So I would like to address the government's violations of the free speech of immigrants, as well as those who work to protect immigrant and refugee communities. Many immigrants and refugees have left home countries where governments restricted their freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. They arrived in a country where such freedoms are protected in the First Amendment of the Constitution. And yet, those who become outspoken community organizers are targeted and silenced by the government. This targeting of immigrants and refugees, particularly people of color, who are speaking up shows the emptiness of the rhetoric about the sanctity of free speech for everyone in this country. By silencing outspoken immigrant organizers, jailing them and inciting violence against them, the government is attempting to keep immigrants in a state of fear and intimidation. The targeting of outspoken immigrants goes back to at least the early 20th century. Consider the Palmer Raids. Between 1919 and 1920, during the Wilson administration, U.S. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer led a number of raids against anyone suspected of having ties to leftist groups. The Palmer Raids resulted in the arrest of 3,000 to 10,000 people, the jailing of thousands, and deportation of hundreds of immigrants. Emma Goldman is one of the people impacted by this ongoing criminalization. A Jewish immigrant to the US, she stands as a significant figure in the history of American radicalism and feminism. An influential and well-spoken anarchist of her day, Goldman was an early advocate of free speech, birth control, women's equality, and union organizing. She was arrested for insight for so-called inciting to riot um, after speaking to unemployed workers and encouraging them to take action and demand work. She was arrested again for publicly teaching women how to use contraceptives. Her criticism of mandatory conscription of young men into the military during World War I led to a two-year imprisonment, followed by her deportation in 1919. In the post 9-11 era, scores of primarily Muslim immigrants were targeted, imprisoned, and deported. And then jumping to the Trump era, the targeting also impacted outspoken immigrants such as Ravi Ragbir, the executive director of the New Sanctuary Coalition and a longtime immigrants' rights leader. He came to the US from Trinidad in 1991. 
Right, Beer advocated against the Trump administration's anti-immigrant policies and has been very critical of ICE, immigration, and customs enforcement, and helped educate community leaders and elected officials on the cost of deporting and separating families. He faced retribution by the government as a result. Um, so ICE had already deported one member of the New Sanctuary Coalition, John Montreville, and it attempted to do the same to Right Beer. Following a routine ICE check-in in January 2018, the heavily surveilled Ragbir was arrested and detained. But Ragbir and his supporters pushed back via organizing and legal action against ICE. They said that the agency was retaliating against him for his speech and an, an appeals court agreed. The judge stated that, quote, public expression of his criticism and his prominence played a significant role in ICE's recent attempts to remove him. And in response to the decision, Ravi Ragbir said, it was all of our voices together that made this decision possible, and we have to continue to speak out against the travesty of our deportation system. Um, we also had another immigrant rights leader, Maru Mora Villaponda of La Resistencia in Washington State, who was also similarly targeted by the government. The New York University Law School's Immigrant Rights Clinic has in fact documented more than 1,000 incidents of retaliation against immigrant rights groups, uh, organizers and journalists. Most of the incidents occurred from 2016 to 2020, but some go as far back as 2012, while others have been documented more recently. From the Obama administration through the Trump administration and continuing to today, the New York Law School um, has um, witnessed ICE seeking to silence dissent within detention centers and deporting um, government informers, uh, whistleblowers, witnesses of mass shootings, and witnesses of medical abuse. Um, and in fact, we saw this in the case of the Irving County Detention Center. So a group of women banded together, detained women banded together and produced a video um, in, in the spring of 2020 um, about their fears of catching COVID. Um, and instead of, uh, once the video got out um, to the outside world, instead of addressing their concerns, um, the guards at this corporate run detention center um, placed them in solitary confinement, which obviously um, posed really significant emotional harm for the women. Um, and then after Project South and other um, partners had um, produced a complaint and put it out to the world about medical abuse against women's bodies at Irving, um, we saw that ICE started deporting um, survivors and witnesses to medical abuse um, and trying to cover its own track again, um, instead of trying to address um, the violations. Um, so we see this again and again. So instead of addressing the grave issues um, that advocates are raising, ICE is using intimidation in an attempt to silence those who speak out. In Georgia, again, um, US Immigration and Customs Enforcement monitored immigrant advocacy organizations engaged in First Amendment protected activity around the Stewart Detention Center. Um, so ICE kept track of our group's protests and social media posts at one point suggesting that the agency might retaliate by barring visitations um, by El Refugio, which is a human rights organization um, facilitating visitations to Stewart. Internal ICE records as, and emails, as well as a deposition by an ICE officer in a court case, show that the agency was referring to an advocacy group, Georgia Detention Watch, as, quote, a known adversary and closely surveilling our activities both online and in person. ICE was monitoring a vigil planned for one of the men at Stewart um, who had died in custody and when informed, um, that the main organizer of the, of the vigil was not a refugio, an ICE official wrote, well, if it was a refugio, I was going to have to put some effort into getting them out of their visitation program. So clear retaliation, attempted retaliation there. When Georgian Detention Watch and other groups organized the vigil to honor the man who died by suicide at Stuart um, Jimenez Joseph, ICE monitored the vigil closely, exchanging multiple, multiple emails and counting attendees as they RSVP'd online. The documents indicate that ICE monitored the real-time presence of advocates at the vigils. ICE officials referred to Georgia Detention Watch, again, as a known adversary and ordered the preparation of a significant incident report for a candlelight vigil. Um, I myself have been subjected to this type of surveillance um, in the spring of 2020 when we um, 
realized that there was a hunger strike happening at Stuart again um, because of lack of protection for COVID, I posted a tweet. Um, and within a couple of hours, I received an email from a local ICE official demanding that I remove the tweet. Um, so um, had never, something like this had never happened to me before and obviously was quite frightening. Um, and it was an example of ICE not only monitoring your speech, but telling you what to do. Uh, it's very much in line with what you'll find in totalitarian regimes. Um, the response of ICE, as we see again and again, is to dismiss abuse, not to do anything to address abuses. And um, you know that social media surveillance targeting immigrants leads to self-censorship. As immigrants, we are forced to have second thoughts before freely posting our political views to social media, especially if they are in opposition to government policies. This surveillance now culminating in overt spying on immigrants is designed as a tactic to control and fracture dissent. It is meant to keep immigrants' political activity in check and keep us from feeling like full members of society. The message this type of surveillance sends to immigrants is that we are not entitled to the full exercise of our First Amendment rights as native-born citizens are. And the government will be watching us closely, and if it determines that we have crossed the line in any way, it will find some way of coming after us. Again, for many of us as immigrants, this is reminiscent of what we were facing in countries where we immigrated from. Systematic surveillance, distribution for political speech, and self-censorship. These tactics of repression are what we may have thought we left behind when we arrived in the US. Uh, in response to such egregious spying meant to chill our freedom of speech, we as immigrants and those working in defense of immigrants should not self-censor or hold back on freely expressing our political opinions. If we were to do that, we would hand the government, which is intent on violating our rights, a clear victory, dealing a huge blow to the First Amendment and other constitutional prote protections. As the immigrants' rights leader, Ravi Raghir said, we have to continue to speak out boldly against policies that we deem racist and xenophobic. And in conclusion, I wanted to bring your attention to a recent Project South report called The Spying on the Margins, the History, Law, and Practice of US Surveillance Against Muslim, Black, and Immigrant Communities and Contemporary strategy, Strategies of Resistance, um, which really delves into the history of COINTELPRO, and targeting of Muslim communities before 9-11, after 9-11, targeting of immigrants, um, and really what communities around the country are doing to fight back against this type of um, surveillance that is meant for, um, that is meant for our communities to live in fear and to engage in self-censorship. Thank you so much, and I look forward to uh, staying in communication about these issues with all of you. Um Thank you so much. And we're um, continuing to be ahead of schedule, which is wonderful um, for the audience having an opportunity. Um, so, but Professor Nunziato, you have your full 14 minutes, I promise. Um, so please go ahead. Okay, so ready to, to go. I th thank you very much to Sammy and to Danielle and to everyone for inviting me and putting on this um, amazing, Symposium. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to attend any of the earlier panels, so um, I hope to, to view the recording uh, of those, but I, I'm going to kind of drill down on some of the important First Amendment doctrines that, that Seth mentioned in, in his discussion uh, and kind of focusing on that, that golden age of uh, civil rights era activists and the First Amendment doctrines that were you know, in part forged in that era and that benefited uh, the, the citizen driven social change in that, uh, in that era. So I wanna go through some of these doctrines and, and, and also talk about the ways in which they are still, still alive and still really important for today's activists and protesters. So, and, and, and just to uh, be clear, we're talking about various types of First Amendment freedoms, right? So freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and association, right to petition the government for redress of grievances, uh, among others. And I'll start with the, the first two, the, the prior restraint doctrine and the maybe related vagueness and overbreadth doctrines that come out of um, 
or that are important in cases like Shuttlesworth and Cox v. Louisiana, where the, the court makes clear that once again, that prior restraints, any sort of system in which we need to get permission from the government before we speak or before we engage in First Amendment activities, prior restraints themselves are highly disfavored. Any sort of permitting scheme, right, in, in the context of asking for permission before you can speak, um, highly disfavored, and that uh, the, the substantive safeguards, as well as procedural safeguards, but the substantive safeguards that the court imposes on any such prior restraint, that the, uh, that the permitting authority cannot enjoy unbridled substance, right? the discretion, the decision-making authority has to be limited by narrow, objective, definite standards. And this comes up in some of our recent cases. Uh, and, and in Shuttlesworth, the court said, where the permitting authority had you know, the, the power to say yes or no based on the public welfare, peace, safety, decency, good order, right? That, that's, that's unbridled discretion. Decision makers um, in such contexts cannot enjoy that sort of unbridled discretion. That's related to the, I think is related to the, the vagueness doctrine and the overbreadth doctrine where the court in, in these civil rights cases uh, reiterated that vaguely worded and overly broad laws that speak to like disturbing the peace are unconstitutional on First Amendment uh, grounds, but also on due process grounds, right? Because they don't give sufficient notice to people of what sort of speech uh, and what sort of speech or activities are, are prohibited. So they're unconstitutional, um, unconstitutionally vague treating the flag contemptuously, right? What does it mean to treat the flag contemptuously? That's, that's too vague, um, unconstitutionally vague. Of course, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of attention paid to the great importance of the public forum doctrine uh, in real space. And I'll talk a little bit about it in cyberspace as, as well as, as others have. So the public forum doctrine granting uh, activists an affirmative right to access the public streets, the public sidewalks, the public parks, to access um, the outside areas outside the seats of government, right? To, to, to effectively petition the government for redress of grievances. Um, interestingly, I, I think we can return to think about the public forum doctrine in the context of public schools and libraries in public schools. In the PICO case, which gets an asterisk because it's not, I, I think it's not really a golden age civil rights era case, but um, prohibits the removal of library books based on disagreement with the ideas that they embody. And I think this is significant for the, the recent gag order legislation that applies to um, teaching systemic racism. So I wanna return, return to that. Um, again, these, these core doctrines that um, are, are somewhat forged and, and strengthened in the, the golden age of the civil rights era. Um, the expressive conduct doctrine, as I was reviewing and thinking about these, um, these important civil rights era doctrines, it, it's worth noting that the expressive conduct doctrine, right, what type of, under what circumstances is conduct considered expressive for First Amendment purposes? The picketing and parading, that seems obvious uh, to us today, but that was uh, discussed by the court in the Shuttlesworth case. Sit-ins, right? Sit-ins in uh, lunch counters and libraries to express uh, viewpoints and express opposition to segregation. Important components of the expressive conduct doctrine that, that also come into play in, in recent cases. The right to associate privately, the right to organize privately. Seth also mentioned the NAACP v. Alabama case and cases like Bates v. Little Rock, where the court held that there's a privacy in association and that compelled disclosure of the NAACP's membership, 
violated those First Amendment rights. And this I, I, I want to discuss in the context of some recent cases involving um, websites and websites used for organization purposes. And let's not forget New York Times v. Sullivan, right, which, which um, strengthens the, the right to criticize public officials of the you know, commissioners in Montgomery, Alabama, um, free of or relatively free of defamation liability. And in that case, the Supreme Court uh, reminds us that that's the central meaning of the First Amendment, that we have the right to criticize our public officials and our government officials. I, I believe we talked earlier about the McKesson case, but I think it's worth returning to NAACP versus Claiborne Hardware for the importance of the right to uh, organize protests, long-term protests, free of liability for the resulting harms. We'll talk more about that when, when we uh, address McKesson. Um, and this, you know, not civil rights activists, but also I think important for some of the recent anti-protest legislation, the Forsyth County case, uh, in which the Supreme Court holds that expressive activities cannot be financially burdened um, based on their unpopularity, based on the content of the speech or the anticipated costs of keeping public order, right? So we'll think about that when we talk about anti-protest legislation. Um, and, and now to turn to modern times and the ways in which these First Amendment doctrines uh, are invoked in today's context, some of the ways in which they're invoked in today's context. Um, in the somewhat little known In Re Dream Host case, the, uh, the Trump administration's Department of Justice sought uh, to get access to the names of not just the registrants, but any visitors to the Disrupt J20, Disrupt January 20th website that was planning a protest of Trump's 2017 inauguration. And the, the um, dream host fought back and uh, fought back by way of protecting uh, the, the names of the visitors to the website and cites NAACP v. Alabama. And uh, the, the, the court, Judge Morin's order, uh, agrees with, with that restriction and seeks to impose um, what he called procedural safeguards on the, the government's overreaching to get that information. Um, expressive conduct, still significant and very important, the expressive conduct doctrine in cases like Fort Lauderdale food, not bombs, that distributing fo uh, food to homeless people in parks constitutes uh, conduct that is expressive for First Amendment purposes. Similarly, a uh, recent die-in at the House uh, cafeteria to, uh, it, to express um, in, in involved in protests. Um, prior restraint doctrine, once again, we turn to cases like uh, Shuttlesworth v. Uh, Birmingham, where the uh, standardless discretion of permitting authorities for deciding, you know, under what circumstances you can distribute food in parks, uh, standardless discretion is unconstitutional. Public forum doctrine, again, in context of the right of the press to access public forums like our streets and, and sidewalks, as Seth was mentioning, and the right, uh, the, the associated right to, to film and document police activity. So the public forum doctrine is still crucially important in, in these contexts. Um, the right to criticize public officials, including on social media, and the extension of the public forum doctrine to social media in cases like uh, the Knight Institute versus Trump, when Trump was still allowed on Twitter and when Trump was trying to block his critics from um, following him and criticizing him, right? And in that case, the court, the, uh, the lower courts ruled that this constitutes, this space constitutes a public forum and uh, so viewpoint discrimination cannot be prohibited within, you can't just kick out people who disagree with, with your views. So 
continued right to criticize our government officials, our public officials, including on social media, uh, in, in spaces that constitute public forums. Um, and as I, th I think we did discuss this earlier, but um, these, these uh, areas of particular concern for, uh, for activists and protesters today include cases like Doe v. McKesson, where the Fifth Circuit ruled that Black Lives Matter leader could be held liable for negligent protest uh, for for the actions of another protester and the, the activity that harmed a police officer Doe in that context. So this is a case that is important for us to, to focus on. And I, I think implicates uh, the, the NAACP versus Claiborne hardware uh, line of cases. Uh, so this is important for us to, to focus on, on that in terms of the right to organize protests free of liability, the first amendment right. Uh, we, I believe we've also talked about recent anti-protest legislation, uh, which uh, has been introduced in 36 states. I, I caught the tail end of, of Justin's uh, presentation and he uh, was pointing to the, 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 same, uh, the, the same source that, that I have here, the ICNL's US protest law tracker, which goes into great detail about this anti-protest legislation, which uh, in, in large part was in response to racial justice demonstrations, which increased- One minute. One minute, which, which increases penalties for activists uh, for, for engaging in activities like obstruction of traffic, which seeks to impose costs for cleanup or for law enforcement. Uh, in, uh, in contravention of the, the Forsyth County precedent and which immunizes public and private actors from liability for harm caused to protesters, including for drivers who unintentionally hit protesters. So these are some areas of concern and an area I think of great concern for activists today is recent legislation introduced in uh, 20 states prohibiting not just high school and lower school teaching, but also in some cases prohibiting college teaching and university teaching about systemic racism, about D DEI, about the 1619 project, et cetera. And I think that the, the PICO case and other cases uh, that I discussed earlier have some bearing on the challenges of, of this legislation. So by way of wrapping up, here are some helpful sources. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so we have um, a number of minutes. We have 14 minutes um, left. And uh, I have some questions from the audience. And um, let me start with a question from Kate Chilton. And this would really be for all of you or anyone who wants to jump in. What do you foresee as the biggest battleground for First Amendment freedoms in the coming years, particularly as the use of technology becomes increasingly prevalent? I'm not sure whether the question is asking about technology being in a surveillance sense or whether it's technology as something facilitating protest, but um, who'd like to weigh in on that? Um. Since my mic is still on, maybe I'll, <laughs> I, did, I forgot to shut it off, I'll weigh in. Um, I mean, I, I think in some sense that we, we are seeing the social media platforms take such a large role and have such a large presence in, in our lives, of course. And um, I think what, what is significant is not, in some sense, is not so much the, the First Amendment law, but First Amendment values that hopefully to, to some extent inform the platforms in terms of their terms of service, in terms of the terms of service and the community guidelines that, that they adopt. Um, so I think that the transition from um, having protests and, and similar civil rights related activities occur in real space to having that occur on the internet um, requires a, a translation of some of our First Amendment 
uh, doctrines to the, the context of social media platforms. And of course, it's not the government that's making the decisions uh, of what speech should and should not be permitted. In that case, it's, you know, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg and whoever's in charge of those platforms. So the, those are, I think, interesting and important questions going forward. Um, let, let, let me build on that uh, in one way and, and, and point and make two other points. I, mean, I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the question of curation by platforms is becoming quite central. Uh, and I guess one thing that I worry about is uh, that enthusiasm for a more, uh, uh, for a less hard edged First Amendment is going to uh, tempt legislatures, as a number of legislatures have been tempted, into trying to interfere with that curation uh, to put a thumb on the scale of their favorite speech. So I think, uh, you know, parallel to the issue of curation, there's going to be an issue of retaining the independence of uh, the online platforms, uh, whether that, and, and to some extent, Section 230 does that today, that's under the possibility of amendment, we're going to see First Amendment issues coming out of that. Second technology point, I think I made this in, in, in the speech, uh, there are a series of pushbacks on uh, the right to record and gather information. Uh, I see that as tremendously, a tremendously important uh, area, particularly because uh, the reason that, for example, the George Floyd uh, outrage took off was because of the capacity to convey vivid images of injustice. Uh, I think that that's going to be an issue. Third point, uh, in, in the last panel, there was uh, commentary, and I think accurate, on the idea that some of uh, the First Amendment activism out of the current Supreme Court is targeted at uh, invoking the free exercise clause as opposed to the free speech and free assembly clauses. And my concern there is partly that uh, the turnabout is fair play and virtual representation quality of contemporary content neutrality doctrine makes it possible for, for example, our clients to take advantage of the Tea Party patriots. Uh, if the protection for expression and assertion of proper of of, uh, of, of challenge is limited to religious protection, then it's only religious claimants who will be able to take advantage of it. And I worry about that. Alrighty, so so let me, um, let me in light of time, let me uh, throw out a couple of questions. And, and why don't we just do a, 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 um, a roundabout and uh, weigh in on either of both or both. Um, there's a question from Jennifer Reith. We live in an age where misinformation proliferates. To what extent should the First Amendment protect free speech that prevents misinformation or opinions as fact? There's, of course, doctrine on this, but um, boy, uh, it really, <laughs> I, I also um, have this question uh, at this point in time. Uh, uh, to what extent uh, uh, sh should it matter um, if it is spread uh, via news versus entertainment as a source? Um, there's also a question from Alyssa Rogowski, who says in 2016, UN Special Rapporteur uh, Maina Kai visited the US to observe protests and assembly, assemblies and later stated, uh, when a right is subject to a permit or authorization requirement, it comes a privilege rather than a right. Um, could you comment on the issue of authorization and permitting? Um, and, and let me just add in John, 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 Johnson Salisbury's point with the disruptive capability of political deep fake videos, um, what First Amendment hurdles do states and federal governments face in regulating them? Um, so uh, Ms. Shashahani, would you like to kick it off and, and just weigh in on any of that? And then um, we'll turn to the others and close out. Sure, and I would also like, there was a question in the um, Q&A from Simran uh, in terms of um, 
um, you know, how can we shift perspectives to give consideration to other perspectives on social media? I would say just the age old perspective of continuing to speak, um, you know, as especially as immigrants and as, um, you know, immigrant dissidents are under attack, I think, um, you know, support by, um, you know, other folks would really um, mean a lot. So, you know, continuing to, um, you know, boost perspectives from immigrant organizers, um, and really fight back against this attempt by um, the government to try to suppress the, the free speech of immigrants. Um, you know, I think what, um, what has led in recent years to the government taking a back a step uh, in terms, you know, to, to, um, to shift their stance a little bit in terms of, you know, going after Robbie Ragbeer and, you know, um, also them allowing um, John Montreville to come back has been the really, um, um, massive uh, outrage <laughs> and uproar um, by people and obviously the positive court uh, decisions on that front. So I think um, really continuing to speak out and uh, bring these issues to the forefront of public attention would be really helpful. I can jump in on the um, misinformation on on the internet and misinformation on social media platforms question. Uh, you know, thinking in particular about medical medical misinformation, COVID related misinformation on the platforms, which the platforms have been over the social media platforms have been completely overrun with, of course, over the past uh, almost two years now. Um, and I think that this is. You know, others correct me if I'm wrong, but th this, from my perspective, is the dark side of the First Amendment, right? We've been talking about uh, the the ways in which the First Amendment has been so helpful for uh, bringing about citizen change, et cetera, citizen-driven social change. But I I, I do think that um, if if the platforms were to adopt the First Amendment. Uh, full full scale, it would be very difficult for them to do anything about um, misinform about medical misinformation. Um, I think that that is largely protected speech under the First Amendment. You know, I, uh, someone says, "Oh, I think ivermectin is a great idea," and someone else says, "I think that's a terrible idea." Right? Um, and I think that we've seen. Uh, more or less some responsible content curation, or at least terms of service that would impose some um, meaningful restrictions on medical and COVID related misinformation by, by the major platforms like, like Twitter and Facebook, at least in, in terms of their, their community guidelines or terms of service. We saw in the past week or so controversy involving um, Spotify continuing to host Joe Rogan's podcast uh, that uh, has, you know, is, is rife. Uh, I'm not a listener, but I understand that it is rife with COVID related um, misinformation. And we've seen that play out in terms of um, pressure, public pressure on Spotify as a um, as a platform to do something about about the problem, right. So this is sort of playing out in terms of um, public public pressure, pressure from Neil Young and others, Joni Mitchell, to do something about it, right? But if, if we were um, talking about First Amendment restrictions on medical misinformation, like, like the kind that, that is at issue in the, the Spotify Joe Rogan uh, controversy, I don't think the First Amendment helps in terms of restricting such speech but I'm interested to hear what, what Seth and others have to say about that. Um, I'm not sure we've got a lot of time left, but to the extent we do, uh, I, I think you're right in saying that the current equilibrium uh, lays the, the, the responsibility of curation with the platforms. Uh, and I think the platforms are not adopting full-scale First Amendment protections, partly because they're international. And the United States is very much a free speech outlier. And uh, it seems to me that what they're adopting is an approach that uh, has a lot more uh, 
opportunity for suppressing or uh, countering misinformation. Now, I'm inclined to think that countering misinformation is more important than suppressing it, but uh, you can debate that. It seems to me that the place the First Amendment is important uh, is in keeping the government's hands off of the platforms. Uh, because uh, little as I like Jack Dorsey and Zuckerberg, uh, the picture of uh, the Florida State Legislature, or for that matter, uh, the coming uh, Republican-dominated United States Congress trying to get rid of, quote, misinformation, close quote, uh, makes my hair stand on end. And I am very much thrown back on a uh, kind of maxim in approach to the First Amendment. So, um, go ahead. No, over, go ahead. Over, we, over... Have, we actually have a minute, so I'll share it with you. Well, well, maybe what we should do then is, um, you know, I just I, I want to thank our panelists so much. And I, I think a, a way to close is to say that with all of the difficulties and promises um, of the First Amendment um, as a tool um, in social protest um, and a tool in social justice generally, um, I am inspired by um, uh, Darren Hutchison's opening. Um, where he encouraged us to come back to John Lewis's uh, 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 admonition that we all engage in good trouble. And, and really the history of the civil rights movement um, has been, was about, and, and really still is, um, basically operationalizing the First Amendment um, and uh, uh, through engaging in, in good trouble. So I, I wish you all well and, um, and, and lots of good trouble. So th thank you everyone um, for uh, participating in this panel. Thank you thank all, you. it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for all the moderation and fine insight. Oh, thank you all for participating in such a, such a great day. And I will not touch the First Amendment. I believe that Professor Dudziak final uh, final conclusion was a great wrap up. For those of you who are seeking CLE credit, um, as long as you've provided your bar number and through the registration link or otherwise to me, um, you, sh you will be receiving those CLE credits. As people are getting ready to leave, I just wanna offer my thank you to everybody that's participated in the panel today, uh, in, in the panels today as a speaker, as a moderator, what have you. Thank you to everyone who has come. Thank you again to the thrower committee for their generous donation, which has made this generous donation and all of their insight, which has made this day really come together very nicely. My biggest thanks to the staff who's helped us, uh, to Rhonda Hearman, Pierre Copeland and Kenyatta Greer, as well as the countless other staff at Emory who has been instrumental in making today come together. Thank you to my peers who have helped, uh, Danielle Kirker, Nina Goodall, Bernal, Simran Modi, and Dave Fowry, who are both actively, um, you saw from Danielle today and doing so much more work in the background. And then finally, for all of you who are interested, um, there will be a symposium issue in volume 72, um, where you can hopefully read more from many of the speakers today, as well as a recording. Um, thank you all. Have a wonderful end of your day and rest of your week. Goodbye.